Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Dodge City entered the territory on west. There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Heavy, Matt? Oh, somehow it was easier carrying him up to your office and back down, Doc. Where are you going to put me, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, well, on the couch here, I guess. Uh, uh, you'll be all right there, Chester? Oh, yes, sir. This will be fine. Good. I'm sure sorry I'm so much trouble. Chester, next time, try to land on just one foot. Even if you break a leg. I know. A man's in a terrible fix when he sprains both ankles. Mm, he sure is, Doc. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what you're going to do. You're going to stay right there on that couch, and you're going to sleep there, too. Maybe Doc and I'll bring you in something to eat every day or two. Oh, no. It's better than you deserve. I know. I've been saying over and over to myself, Chester, you fool, you. <clears throat> well... The wages of sin, Chester. <laughs> you were lucky to get off as easy as you did. <clears throat> the way I heard it. Uh, come on, Chester. Tell us what really happened. Huh? <laughs> but I did tell you. I was a looking out this second story window, admiring the view, so to speak. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I fell. That's all right onto the street. He didn't say whose window, Chester. In Texas, Doctor, a gentleman don't mention such things. You ain't in Texas. Well, sometimes I wish you'd never laugh. <laughs> like now? Yes, like now. <laughs> Many a reputation's been ruined by just such loose talk that you're making, Doc. Never mind, Doc Chester. He's jealous, that's all. Oh, jealous? Uh, putting tracks in a man's yard? <laughs> Not me. Not by a long side. Why, no, sir. Oh. And, uh, good morning, Marshal. Well, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Oh, there's Chester. <laughs> Heard about you, Chester. I heard... Never mind what you heard, Torp. Chester just got thrown from a horse, that's all. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, All right. What is it you want here, gentlemen? Yeah. All right, you tell him, Summers. Well, Marshal, it's about tomorrow night. Oh? So what about tomorrow night? Well, you know, it's the roundup. The sales season's over. There'll be a thousand cowboys celebrating in Dodge. Well, they always do at the end of the season. What about it? Well, there's going to be more of them this year, and there'll be a lot of homesteaders in town, too. It's going to be worse than ever. Well, I expect that. There could be a lot of trouble, Marshal. <laughs> yeah, there could be, Summers. Just what is it you want? Well, we've talked it over, and uh, we want you to get a lot of good, tough men together, maybe about uh, 20 of them, and deputize them. That way, there won't be any trouble. Yeah. That's what you want, is it? Yes, we do. Look, Summers, my job's to keep the peace around here, and I'm going to do it, but I'll do it in my own way. Oh, I know, Marshal. Now, you turn 20 deputies loose in that crowd looking for trouble, and they're going to find it. As soon as the wild ones heard about it, they'd bunch up and shoot it out with every one of them. Why, it'd turn into the worst slaughter Dodge has ever seen. I think that's about the most fool idea I ever heard of. Yeah, no reason for you to talk like that, Marshal. I think it's a good idea. I sure don't want my place wrecked just because you're mule-headed. You're a gambler, Torp. So? So you can take your chances along with everybody else. Now, if you don't want that, then close your place up tomorrow night. Well, lose all that Texas money? <laughs> no, that's not likely. 
Now, we're not all gamblers, Marshal. They can wreck my dry goods store just as fast as a gambling house once they get started. And it's up to you. That's right. It is up to me. And we're going to leave it that way. Then uh, you won't do anything. I'll do everything I can. I don't know, Marshal. Look, Summers, I know you've got your doubts about me. That's natural. Some people think I'm too lax with Front Street. Some think I'm too severe. But that's the way of it in any town. If a peace officer does his job well, he pleases nobody. Marshal, we didn't come here for a lecture. What did you come for, Torp? Maybe you had in mind to help me pick out those deputies. Is that it? A matter of fact, I could, Marshal. Yeah, sure, sure. In a couple of hours, yours would be the only tables open for play. No, that's not what it's I... It's been have. done before, Torp. Is that too, Torp? We're not going to take his word for anything, are you? I don't know. But anyway, he won't listen to us, so it's his responsibility. Come on, men, let's get out of here. I hope you can handle it, Marshal. Goodbye, gentlemen. That torp is no good. He is just plain no good, Mr. Dillon. Well, I know one man that got skinned at his place, and torp gave him back $20 so as he wouldn't be broke. Huh? Just how much did this man lose, Doc? Oh, five or six hundred, they said. Uh, then he... Uh... Oh, yeah, I see what you mean, man. I'm sure not going to be much good to you tomorrow night, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you can watch the jail right here, Chester. I know, but you just got to get somebody to help you out on the street. At least one man, anyway. You can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, but tomorrow night, Dodge will be overrun with trail boys and homesteaders all looking for satisfaction. No, I wouldn't ask any man to face that. I know a few fellows who'd do it, and so do you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, maybe, but I wouldn't ask anybody. How many were killed last year, man? I don't remember. Well, I do. Six, that's what. We buried them all in the saddle blankets. All except one. I remember he didn't even own a blanket. (laughs) Why, then he was sure out of luck all the way around, wasn't he? Come on, Doc. Let's go get some dinner. All right. We'll bring you a piece of bread, Chester. Maybe. I want a steak. Rare. (laughs) How come you're so hungry, Chester? Were you in such a hurry to get over there last night you didn't take time for supper? Mr. Dillon... I will answer no more questions about last night, and that is final. <laughs> well, we'll bring you something. Yeah, I don't know if we should, though, Matt. A man can think about his sins better on an empty stomach. Close the door, mm. will you? <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, I had Mr. Hightower print up some signs for me with a few rules that I made up for the roundup. They were fair and reasonable, and I hoped they'd be accepted without question. The principal restrictions were that there was to be no shooting, and no reckless riding in the streets. That afternoon, I went from saloon to saloon and left a sign at each one. The Texas Trail was my last stop, and there I sat down with Kitty for a short beer. Town's beginning to fill up, Matt. Yeah, it'll be swamped to the dashboard by dark. You um, expect trouble tonight? I always expect trouble, Kitty. Yeah, I know. Matt, I heard something. Yeah? I heard Torp and a few of his men cut cards last night. So? I don't know who it came out for, but Low Man is supposed to kill you. Oh. When? Tonight, I suppose. Why is Torp after you, Matt? Uh, Torp says he wants an open town, Kitty. But what he's really after is somebody who'll close down every game but his. Mm. Who's this, man? What? Rough-looking traveler headed this way. What? What? Well, I'll be. <laughs> Why, it's Zell Matlock. Matt Zell! Zell, you old badger. How are you? <laughs> Zell, it's been a long time. Very a long time. Mad. Here, come on over here. Sit down. Sure. Uh, I'd like for you to meet Kitty. Kitty, this is Zell Matlock. This is Kitty. Uh, Glad to doing? know you, ma'am. <laughs> Just rode into Dodge an hour ago. Yeah, it's your first time in a Zell. Hey, would you like a beer? Huh? Don't mind. Good. I uh, aim to get drunk tonight, but before I got started, I thought I'd look up the peace officer and shoot him. I'd be sure to tangle with him before the night's out. 
I always figure it's safer to do it sober. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he half means that, kid. So I asked around and found out the man's name is Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. I've seen it all now. Well, I hope you're not disappointed. I'll, so. I'll tell you, Miss Kitty, I knew Matt Dillon before he got civilized. Why, we had to tie his leg up to give him a haircut when he came to town. <laughs> Don't you believe a word that he says, kid. <laughs> yeah, the wilder the coat, the better the horse, Matt. Mm-hmm. Well, you was all right. The only trouble with you was that fool honest streak you always had. <laughs> Are you rich now, Zell? Uh, nobody's rich on the Mexican border. Land of sunshine and pinna beans. Now, I hired out to a general over in Chihuahua three years ago. I lost 20 pounds and was lucky to get back at all. Well, haven't you learned to stay out of Mexico yet? No, I met the man he wanted me to shoot and turned out to be a better fellow than the general. So I told him I'd been hired to kill him and then rode for the border. The general lost three soldiers who tried to stop me from swimming the Rio Bravo. <laughs> uh, you must be pretty handy with a gun, Zell. Yeah, just fair, ma'am. But when I take my gun out, I go right ahead and use it. Some people stop and think for half a second. Um, there's a roundup in Dodge tonight. Matt's handling it alone. Kitty, what the... Yeah, no, no, hold it, hold it, man. I heard about it. I heard all about it, and that's why I'm here. To say hello and uh, sign on for a night's pleasure. Give me a star, Matt. I've killed on the side of the law before. <laughs> I don't believe that in any way. I... I don't want any killings here. No, I was joshing you, Matt. I know what you want. It's true. I was sheriff in Tascosa for six months. You what? Yeah, it's in the record. Well, they caught up with me there, but I've already done such a good job taming the place that the governor pardoned me. <laughs> I won't kill anybody tonight that don't need killing. All right, all right. I believe you so. But uh, I won't ask any man to come in when it's as rough as this roundup may be. Well, you didn't ask me. Any other objection? Well, uh, the men don't know you around here, so no telling how they'd take to a stranger. First night I ran Tascosa, nobody knew me either. I'm not green at this business. Yeah, but man. it's my job. Why should you get mixed up in it? <clears throat> well, I I also heard somebody's planning a party for you tonight. Well, you did, huh? I've owed you something for... A long time, Matt. Oh, that's got nothing to do with it. Oh, it has. You got no right not to let me pay it back a little. Now, there's a chance to. <laughs> yeah, you're just as crazy as you ever <laughs> were. That's better. Well, come on, let's go find me a badge before it gets dark. <laughs> sure, nice to have met you, Miss Kitty. Well, good luck, Zell. I'll see you later, Matt. Yeah, sure. So long, Kitty. <laughs> Sure been a long time coming to Dodge, Mr. Matlock. What do you mean, Chester? Well, I've heard Mr. Dillon mention you a lot, but the way he talked, I wasn't never sure you were still alive. <laughs> oh, well, I was never sure either, Chester. You know, Zell isn't the most cautious man I ever knew. Well, you think being a U.S. Marshal isn't asking for an early grave, man? Oh, maybe. But at least it's a way to do some good before you die, whether folks think so or not. No, men like Torp, that's all. Oh, no, Chester. Even good men have got a strange twist that makes them suspect any man paid to handle the bad element. Hey, you just can't help thinking that some of its dirt is rubbed off on him. And I never thought about that before, Matt. Sure, how it was in Tascosa. They wanted me there, all right, but they wanted me to uh, keep my distance, too. It makes a man kind of lonely. Yeah. They just don't know what's good for them, that's all. Uh, Instead of a real lawman, they'd rather hire some killer with a lot of noxious carved on his gun. Well, there are plenty of them around. You sure are. Bragging kind. I never did like a man who has to notch his gun to keep his courage up. Yeah. My goodness. Look yonder. Mm-hmm. The street's about full already and it isn't even dark yet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, give yeah. me a hand here, will you? We'll move Chester's well, couch away from the window well, there. All right. There, that should do it. Yeah, you'll be safer here, Chester, in case somebody gets it in mind to shoot up the jail. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. I can watch both doors from here. Uh, just hand me my gun belt, if you will. Oh, yeah. There you are. Well, come on, Sal. 
Uh, Chester, I'll get somebody at the Dodge House to fetch up some supper, huh? Thank you, sir. And and good luck, both of you. So long, Chester. I see you, Chester. Well, how are we working, Matt? Uh, I'll tell you, Zell, you take this uh, side of the street. Uh, I'm going up to the Dodge House, and then I'll be on the other side somewhere. All right. Oh, say, you mind if I go back later and get that Spencer carbine of yours? Make a mighty handy club if I don't have to use it any other way. <laughs> sure, it's yours. Yeah. Who they got there? That fella on their shoulders. Oh, that's Mr. Hightower. He runs the printing press here. Shall, shall we stop it? Oh, no, no. They're just carrying him into the Longhorn to make him stand some drinks. Oh, They like Hightower. They won't hurt him. Well, I guess that sort of officially opens this here roundup, huh? Yeah, I guess it does. Well, I'll leave you here, Zell. Yeah, sure. Sure, man. And, uh, Zell, I, uh... <laughs> I want to thank you for what you're doing tonight. I ain't done nothing yet, but I'll do plenty if someone shoots you in the back. <laughs> I can promise that. Yeah. Well, I'll see you later. Sure, Matt. <laughs> Return for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, Sunday nights, you are cordially invited to escape via CBS Radio. Yes, every weekend for drama that will take you right out of this world, listen for Escape at the Star's Address. Also, tomorrow evening, CBS Radio brings you Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday night playhouse. Now, for the second act of Gun Smoke. <laughs> When I came out of the Dodge House, Front Street was so full that if anybody had been shot, the crowd would have carried him along like one of the living. I had a feeling that the word was out about Torp and his bunch cutting cards to see who'd make a try for me, and that the crowd knew it and was waiting for it. I stood for a while with my back against Summer's dry goods store, and then I left the street and cut down an alley thinking to change my position with as much irregularity as possible. I was passing the back door of the Texas Trail when I heard the first shot of the night. I entered the saloon from the rear and made my way into the crowd. Yeah. It's all right, Marshal. There's no fight. It's not all right, Sam. I made a rule that there'd be no shooting for any reason. All right. Who fired that shot? Oh, it's outside. It was Torque, Marshal. He, he just took a shot at the moon, that's all. Yeah. All right, Torp. Put the gun away and come over here. I'm bothering nobody, Marshal, excepting maybe you. Stand back, everybody. I said that's enough, Torp. No, it ain't, Dylan. This time I got the jump on you. You ain't pushing me no more. Torp's bullet just grazed my arm. Then I put one in his head and another in his chest. And at the same time, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure with a gun in each hand move out of the shadow of the alley and turn toward me on the boardwalk. And without really looking, I dropped him with one shot. And then I faced the crowd and waited for the next move. But for some reason, none came. Marshal? Yes, Summers. That uh, man you just shot, Marshal. Torp got what he deserved. Yes, I know. It's the other one that so I... So did he. Marshal, you'd better go take a look at that man. He's dying. Who is he? I don't know him, Marshal. But you do. What? He's wearing a star. No. No. Oh, Zell. Zell. Matt. I think that did it. No, Zell. No. It's my fault. I crossed the street a while back. Left the carbine with Chester. It's no fault of yours. Matt. That old who 
Oh, there you are. Oh, man. Uh, how, how is he? Oh. Oh. Oh, goodness. No use, Doc. Thanks. So I, I now, think... listen. Listen to me, Matt. You did right. The only thing you could do. It was my fault. I shouldn't have crossed over and come up behind you. Anyway, Matt, I ain't been living on my own time ever since that day you pulled me out of the mob in Almogordo. I never thanked you for that. I guess I never will now. Matt? So long. I'll find someone to carry him over to your office, man. No. I'll carry him. What happened? I heard the shooting. Put a blanket on the floor there, Doc. Yeah, sure. Yeah, spread it out right here. He's dead, Chester. Well, who shot him, sir? I shot him, Chester. I didn't know it was him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dillon. It sounds like they're going to hoorah the town after all, Matt. Sure does. No. No, they're not. It's going to be kind of hard to stop now, isn't it, Matt? Maybe. You taking a shotgun, Mr. Dillon? Matt, why don't you just let them fight each other? What are you going to do? I'm going to close Front Street. You're going to close... Oh, no, the party's over in Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you can't do that. There'll be trouble if I don't. The mob's tasted blood now. They'll shoot you sure as I'm laying here. Will they? All right, I can't stop you, but I sure do wish I could go with you. Yeah, Matt, I'll go. Maybe if they see me, they won't be so quick. Thanks, but this isn't your job, either one of you, but thanks. Close up and turn out your lights. What? You heard me! Now listen to me! Broad Street's closed! Now get out of here and go home, all of you! My home is in Texas, mister. If you ever had one. I ain't going home tonight. Not tonight, I ain't. Don't interfere, fella. You got no chips in this deal. I could buy in, mister. <laughs> Now I'll use this shotgun for what it was meant on the next man. Well? All right, Sam, close it up. Yes, sir. Close, put out your lights. Huh? You heard me. Lock the place up. I know. I ain't going to do it. Now, don't tell me what you're going to do. All right, boys. We're closing up. That took care of the Texas Trail and the Longhorn. And I moved on through the Oasis and the Olifraganza, and then to the smaller bars that infested the outskirts of town. When I came back up Front Street, the crowd had thinned, its fever broken. I'd left Torp's place for the last, thinking to give his men a chance to get out of town before they faced me. There was a gambling hall on the same side of the street as the jail. And when I reached it and entered, there weren't more than a dozen men there. And most of them stepped quietly past me out into the street. 
What was left didn't seem to count for much. Looking for somebody, Marshal? You a friend of Torp's? Well, yes, I was. Why? Who else here worked for Torp? Everyone's gone, Marshal. They heard you were all riled up and they left. Then you're alone. And still in bad company. I wouldn't ordinarily take that. Well, go ahead, mister. You're calling it. No. Not now. What's stopping you? No, if it's the shotgun... Now, does that make it easier for you? I haven't been looking for you, Marshal. You were in on the cut, weren't you? Torp's dead, Marshal. Isn't that enough? Torp! Mister, one of the best men I ever knew died tonight. And I killed him. I'm not a gunman, Marshal. You wouldn't be proud killing me. What does a man like you know about pride? Now, you get out of Dodge and you get out fast. But I don't... You want to die in this place right now? No, I'm leaving. All right, hurry. The rest of the night, I walked the dark, empty street alone. And just before dawn, I got a spring wagon and loaded Zell onto it. A couple of hours later, I buried him out by the Arkansas in a little grove of cottonwoods. Maybe I should have put a marker on his grave. But I didn't. What I did instead, I did partly out of scorn for the kind of men Zell said have to notch their guns to keep their courage up. And partly as a kind of a cross that I'd bear from now on. So instead of a marker on his grave, I took out my gun. And I cut a single notch on it. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Boehner and Harry Bartell, with Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, and James Nusser. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen to CBS Radio for Spring Byington as December Bride. And say, after you hear December Bride tomorrow night, listen for the important announcement about its new night and time on CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network.
around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Everything was all right until about a mile north of the Cimarron. That's when my horse got a hoof caught in a frozen dog hole and broke his leg. So I had to shoot him. It made me feel awful bad. I didn't feel any better thinking about the walk ahead of me. Close to 40 miles to dodge and carry in my saddle all the way. I guess I'd been on the trail about an hour, near as I could figure it was around 3 in the afternoon. And I'd ease the saddle off my shoulders for a rest and a smoke. And that's when I saw the stranger riding up from the way I'd come. He was tall and thin. And his horse was taller and even thinner. And they made quite a pair. Hi. Right. How are you? You lost? No. My horse busted his leg away back. I'm on my way to Dodge. Oh, it's your horse, huh? I saw it. Yeah. On your way to Dodge, huh? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you got any more of that tobacco? Yeah, sure. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. That's okay. Kind of a big walk you've got ahead, ain't it? <laughs> Kind of. It's going to be dark soon. You figure making camp? Ah, that's the idea. Uh -huh. Well, it's too bad. Yeah. Do you need any food? No, 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 thanks. I, I got enough. Uh -huh. Well, I thank you for the tobacco. Sure. Anytime. Hey. Yeah? Not saying this beast won't drop dead from the shock, but do you want to climb on behind? Save you a piece of boot leather for a while, anyway. Why, well, I'd be much obliged if you think that animal of yours can carry us. Well, she won't mind. Should have been dead a long time ago, except she don't know it. She don't mind. Well, okay, thanks. Uh, here, will you hold my saddle till I get up, huh? Yeah, give it to you. Yeah. Uh, can you manage the saddle? Yeah, give it to me. Yeah, I got it. Now, let's go. You heading for Dodge, too? Not in particular. Just north. Uh-huh. This beast will do about ten knots with the wind behind her, but we ain't going to get more than five with this load. You ain't in no hurry, are you? Well, I, I was kind of hoping to get back tonight. It's a... Christmas Eve, you know. Oh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. That backbone of hers sticking it in? Oh, no, it's okay. Thanks. Notice that tin doojigger tied to you. You with the law? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Marshal. Uh, my name's Matt Dillon. That's so. I've never seen a marshal on foot. <laughs> well, it happens sometimes. How is it you're down this way? And it might off your course? Hmm? So you marshal down here as well as Dodge? No, no. I, I just took a prisoner across the Cimarron into Oklahoma Territory. Turned him over to the army there. Did, huh? And then he shot up tight. We must have ridden a couple of miles without a word. I got to thinking about Dodge and Chester and Doc and Kitty and the rest of them. You know, there's something pretty special about any place at Christmas time. 
<laughs> the backbone of the stranger's nag was just about to split me in two when he talked up. My name is Cowley. Oh? Amos Cowley. Uh, better heave to a spell. She's breathing mighty hard. All right, hold up. Yes. Ah. Yeah, it's getting a little chilly, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could I trouble you for another smoke? Oh, sure, sure. Here you are. I thank you. Say, hmm? what's it like in Dodge? What? Dodge. Well, what's it like? <laughs> oh, it's like any other town, I guess. <laughs> Pretty big, huh? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. Not so big as New York, though. Oh, oh no, 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 not as big as that. You know, I haven't been in a big town now for more than ten years. Oh, is that so? No. Been down the territories, drifting. Thought I'd move up north this time, maybe go back east. So you're from the east, huh? Some time back. Say, what's it like? What? Well, Dodge, any town, uh, at Christmas. Same as it used to be? Well, I guess so. Uh, what do you do? Well, same as most people, I guess. What most people do at Christmas. Well, that ain't saying a lot. What are the folks like? And what does it look like? I, I just... I just kind of like to know. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, well, there's Front Street, uh... That's most of Dodge right now. Of course, it's getting bigger all the time. Do you have any kids? No, no, I'm I'm not married. Yeah. Kids have fun Christmas. Yeah, yeah, they do. That's certain. And Dodge, they sometimes have a party for the kids. A couple of days before Christmas. Uh, Kids like that. And then everybody gets feeling good, looking forward to Christmas Eve. Like last year. There was snow on the ground, but the sky was clear. You you could even see the stars. I was going down the street to the Texas Trail to meet Doc and Chester. Uh, Chester, he's my deputy. Doc's a doctor in town. We had some work to do later on in the evening. You could uh, see the light shining behind the curtained windows, and almost everybody had a sprig of holly berries hanging up. They got some from the east a couple of days earlier. I... I remember running into John Bumby. He's a kind of general handyman in Dodge. Never says much, but <laughs> he sure had a lot to say that night. Oh, hello, Marshal. Oh, hi, John. <clears throat> a lovely night for Christmas Eve, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is, John. Yeah. Pretty fine night. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, <laughs> Mr. Dillon. Yeah, that's the way it should be, John. Um... You know, Marshal, this is going to be quite a night for me. Yes, sir. Oh, is that oh, so? Oh, yes, sir. Tonight, I'm asking Mrs. McNish to become Mrs. Bumby. What? Mm-hmm. What, well, John, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, I know it's been a mighty fast secret, but I, I'm popping the question tonight. Well, oh. I wish you a lot of luck, John. Hey, I'll I tell you what. Come by to the Texas Trail later and... And we'll have a drink on it. Oh, I will. I really will, Marshal. <laughs> You're good and kind, Marshal. Good and kind. Merry Christmas, Marshal Dillon. Merry Christmas. Well, the same to you, John. That may sound kind of funny to you, but John Bumby's a good man. A little peculiar sometimes, but good as they come. And they don't make enough like him. Of course, most everybody in Dodge suspected Doc and Ms. McNish were sweet on each other. But it just goes to show you. Uh, I'll tell you about John and Ms. McNish a little later. So I went on down the street. You know, it's a funny thing about those words, Merry Christmas. Men say it to each other, and, well, it makes them feel kind of good. I know what you mean. Used to be a seafaring man myself. When you're on the sea and it comes Christmas, things like that can... They can count a lot. Yeah. Well, we might as well get underway again, huh? Sure. All right. Hey. 
You want to take my yep. saddle? Give it here. Okay. All right. Give it to me. Okay. I guess... I guess you'll miss it in Dodge tonight. I mean, won't you? Well, if you could get a little more out of this nag of yours, we might make it tonight. Oh, there's not a chance. She'll be on her beam ends pretty quick. She's been on a long reach since sunup. Ah. Oh. Mighty bare country up this way. All right. It depends on what you're used to, I uh, Mighty bare where I've been, too. It's not like the sea. That's always different. How come you left it? I always heard a sailor doesn't ever get it out of his blood. Uh, the sea? <laughs> I guess you can get it out of your blood, all right. You got the right reason you can. Yeah, I guess so. Hey. You trying to get something out of me? But, well, no. Get what? I, I would just remark... You want to you ride know. with me? I don't want any talk about the sea. Well, you brought it up. <clears throat> I get it. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night, Jack Benny and his whole fun-making gang make a personal appearance at a Long Beach, California veterans' hospital. It's going to be a Christmas they'll never forget, as Benny and the bunch cut loose while they assist the folks at the hospital in trimming their Christmas tree. Be sure to join the fun tomorrow night on CBS Radio, when it's Jack Benny time all across America. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Amos Cowley sulked his way along the trail for the next while. And then it was almost like he couldn't stand the quiet. Or maybe he had things on his mind. He turned his head. Go on. What? Go on. Tell me some more. Oh, about Dodge? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Well, you try some more, huh? Well, uh... They got a little pine tree in the Texas a Trail. Tree? Yeah, I come down a long way from the north. Uh, uh, Kitty Russell, she, she's a hostess in the Texas Trail. Well, she, she got a lot of ribbon and gee-gaws and made it look real nice. That, that was last Christmas. A star at the top? A star? Yeah. yeah, I think so. It looked like a star, I guess. It <laughs> sure looked pretty. And there was, a, well, a, a, a difference in the place that day. Everybody was celebrating and feeling real good. The doors would swing open and somebody would come in and, you know, maybe somebody you just knew to nod at, but because it was Christmas Eve, he'd come right up and say, hello. Oh, maybe that's a good reason, maybe not. I don't know. All right, I'll tell you. Anyhow, it was still kind of early. Kitty and Chester were standing off looking at the tree. Hi, Matt. Good evening, Mr. Dillon. Hi, Kitty. Chester. How do you like it, Matt? Christmas tree. That's oh, yours. that's real pretty. Only tree but one in the whole town. Yeah, Kate's got one over at the Alphaganza. Oh, well, I'll have to see it later. Sure, you're next. Where, where's Sam? I don't know. Maybe he started celebrating too soon. Oh. Doc's taking over the bar. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You, you want a drink, Kitty? Yeah. Sure. All uh, oh, right, I'll get you a drink. I'll get you uh, You haven't forgotten anything, have you, Mr. Dillon? Forgotten? Uh, what, Chester? Uh, there. What did I tell you, Miss Kitty? I knew just as sure as my nose that oh, you forgot. Oh, that. No, no. I, I hadn't forgotten. Oh, well, I, I thought as soon as I get Sam sober enough to take care of the customers, we could go on over to Doc's like we planned. Sure, we'll do that, Chester. Here you are, Matt. Ah, thanks, Doc. Ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still snowing out? No, no, it's not. Uh, wh where are you going, Kitty? All right. Just want to look outside. Oh. 
real pretty. Man thinks of a lot of funny things that don't mean much. Kitty standing at the door, sniffing the cold air, and the warmth inside, and the whiskey in me. It, it, it was a good feeling. And then Chester and I decided to take a bottle over to Mr. Hightower. He's the telegraph operator over at the depot. He runs a printing shop on the side. Say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Do you mind if I stop by the church for a minute? Well, no, I don't mind. I just feel kind of right tonight, Mr. Dillon. Figure out to thank somebody for it. Sure. So we stopped by the church. I've never been much of a man for a church, I guess, but I went along with Chester. There wasn't anybody else there, just the two of us. Guess we sat for ten minutes in that place. Chester a little way off with his head bowed. You know, there's a lot of peace in a church. Maybe, maybe it's the quiet. Maybe, maybe it's the good that people find in there. Whatever it was, it made a man feel glad about pretty much everything. I haven't been in a church since I don't know when. Oh, is that so? I uh, heaved to. Well, she's becalmed again, mister. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, she sure wasn't built for it, I'll tell you. You ever see anything like that? <laughs> uh, she is kind of old, isn't well, she? I've had her going on eight years. She hasn't changed a mite. Eats like a pig and looks like a four-legged mizzenmist. <laughs> Smoke? Don't mind. Hey, what about that, uh, that fellow Hightower? Did you get that bottle to him? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I guess it was lonely over in the depot all alone. He... He was glad for the company. There was a wood fire burning in the stove, but it didn't keep out the cold. Well, how are you, gents? Merry Christmas. Well, Merry how's Christmas. it going, Mr. Hightower? Oh, slow, Marshal, slow. Bit of excitement about an hour back, though. That huh? so? Yeah. 9.15 got stuck between here and Hutchison. Lots of snow back there. They getting her out? I'm sure they're trying, but <laughs> I'm sure glad I'm not on it. It's going to be a cold night on that train. Well, it's kind of chilly in here, isn't it, Mr. Hightower? Any warmer, and I'm going to sleep. It will say we brought you over a bottle of Irish for company. <laughs> Jameson's well. I declare I was just thinking about a tot before you boys come in. Now, that's real <laughs> friendly. Will you have a drink with me? We sure will. Let's open her up, huh? A couple of glasses up on the shelf there, Chester. Get them down, will you? I don't know if you get an idea about the folks in Dodge or not. They, they're not any different than any other people. Or the town either. Uh, I guess maybe it's a pretty small place at that. The depot, the hall, a few stores, a church, Doc's office, a Texas trail, Alifaganza, my office. Uh, well, not much, but... Hey, it's where you live, you know? Sounds all right. I lived in a town once back east. Small. I know what you mean. Well, maybe you'll be going back. Maybe. Say, the kids, they still believe in St. Nick. Oh, sure. I, I Mighty suppose. few kids down where I've been. Injun kids, they don't believe in St. Nick. No reason they should, I guess. I used to believe in it, you know that? Well, I guess most people did one time or another. Hey, you figure we come maybe ten miles? Maybe. Yeah, it's getting dark. Yeah. Well, come on. You want to... You want to ride the saddle for a bit? Oh, no, no. I, uh, that's okay. Well, then, okay. We rode on, and I thought about last year, about Kitty... Doc and Chester and me 
going over to Doc's place after Doc caught tired at Tendon Bar at the Texas Trail. It was about a quarter to midnight, and we stood around and sang Christmas carols. And I, I remember how it sounded that night, how it looked. The glow in the stove in the middle of the room, and uh, the frosty windows. That was Christmas Eve, all right. It was so deep, nowhere, 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 nowhere. Born is the King of Israel. (laughs) (laughs) Say, that was fine. That was just fine. Yes, it was. Oh, gee. Uh, Say, now... What do you say if hey, we... Hey, uh, hey, listen. Hey. Huh? Huh? Oh. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, I feel sentimental. That's exactly what I feel. I feel sentimental. I know what you mean, Doc. I surely know. Okay, Doc. Bring him out. <laughs> And I remember how Doc scuttled over to the bureau and brought out some packages. The presents weren't much, but it didn't matter what they were. And when we'd finished opening them, it was Chester who said what we were all thinking. I just... I I, I just want to say, Miss Kitty, Doc, you, Mr. Dillon... I just want to say that this is the best doggone Christmas I ever had. And and that's what I want to say. Say, you was going to tell me about that uh, that fellow John was caught in that woman. What was her name? Oh, oh, yeah. Ms. McNish. That's right. Well... She said yes, and you've never seen two happier people in your whole life. Yeah, she's Ms. McNish Bumby now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, you know, you might settle for a bit in Dodge or you could get work there. Sure would be fine if you could get back tonight, wouldn't it? Well, it, it can't be helped. I'd be a lot further away and a sight more tired if you hadn't come along. <laughs> Now, listen, how far do you figure before there's a place you might pick up a horse? Oh, I don't know, 15 miles or so, maybe. Oh, I'm not going to make any 15 miles in this nag tonight, that's for sure. Oh, that's all right. Now, I tell you what, you go on alone, you see. Oh, no, forget it. Now, you go on alone. She'd hold out with one man on her. And then you get a fresh horse and you ride into Dodge tonight. Well, thanks, that's very I'm telling you, I want you to go. I'll be fine, I've walked before. Probably make it almost as quick as you... Look, it's, it's real nice of you, Mr. Cowley, but no thanks. Uh, now, Christmas don't mean nothing to me. You got friends waiting for well, you. Well, I'll see them tomorrow. Ah, uh, you're a fool. Well, that may be. All of them nice folks, you are going to make them feel pretty bad. Uh, look, I'll stay. If you want to go on along, uh, uh, thanks for the ride. Well... Might as well make camp, then. I guess so. And listen, you want to tell me some more about uh, what you was telling me before we turn in? Well, sure. I Uh, take it kindly, mister. I'll get yourself settled. I got some stuff in my pack we can eat and maybe get a fire going. Then after we eat, you can tell me some more. We made a fire and then shared what we had for supper. He seemed to soften up after that, and we talked for a couple or three hours. It was like he was starved for news of people, everyday things, and just plain company. And that's how we spent Christmas Eve together out on the plane. And then when the fire was dying down and I was about ready for sleep, he said, Marshal, 
Yeah? I want to tell you something. I've been needing to tell it for a long time. Do you mind? Well, of course I don't mind. Well, then I'll tell you. A few years ago, I was skipper of a little schooner. I used to sail up and down the East Coast, you know, Boston, New York. Yeah. Well, one night, we hit dirty weather off New Jersey, real dirty. Blew us off course, and we piled up on the rocks and knocked the bottom out. That's too bad. There was 18 passengers aboard, Marshal. Four of them was kids. We never saw them again. No. And my own... My own wife and my kid went down, too. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, no. Something must have happened to me after that. I didn't want nothing to do with with ships or the sea, and I started to drift out this way. I couldn't forget, though, do you know? And I didn't want to be near folks, especially kids, to remind me, do you know? Yeah. Well, that's how come I've been slewing around ever since. Sure, I understand. Just kind of wanted to get it off my chest. Sure. Marshal. I'd like to ride into Dodge with you tomorrow. You think I might meet some of them folks you was telling about? Oh, I, I don't see why not. But that'd be all right. Maybe I wouldn't need to drift no more. Maybe I could... Uh, <laughs> drop anchored, you know. Yeah, you might at that. Yes. Well... Good night. Good night. Merry Christmas, Marshal. Merry Christmas, Mr. Cowley. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, with Harry Bartell and John Daner, Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Edgar Bergen's real-life daughter Candy pays him and you a visit on the Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. Candy and Charlie hit it off fine, but Edgar has cause to regret his hasty decision to invite his six-year-old daughter into the show, especially when she starts throwing her voice. Sounds like fun tomorrow night on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Edgar Bergen Show with Charlie McCarthy. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Eve Arden is our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network.
around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Oh, we're inside a Dodge anyway, Chester. There's Ellen Henry's homestead. Wonder how she'd take to serving up a breakfast, Mr. Dillon. I'm plumb hungry. I'll settle for water and the horses. I don't imagine Ellen has any extra food. No, sir. It's gone pretty hard for her since Ethan died, hasn't it? That's the talk. Look at her place. Three lean-tos and not a green thing growing. I don't know how she makes out. Well, maybe Luther helps more than the folks give him credit for. For a son, he's not much good to my way of thinking. I don't know when he turns a hand for his mother between stops at the Texas Trail and the Long Branch. At least not much like his father was. Or Ellen either, for that matter. That's a mite early. Nobody's stirring. Oh, oh, oh. We better just water our horses and ride on, Chester. Yes, sir. Quiet like, isn't it? Hey, where'd you come from, Mr. Dillon? Uh, from the house, I think. Luther? I don't know. You're trespassing. Get off my land. It's Marshal Dillon, Ellen. We just stopped to water our horses. I recognize you. The trespassing still goes, Marshal. You're awful quick to fire, Ellen. Ethan and me never took to folks arriving unannounced. I still don't take to it. Well, that's no cause to be firing on us that way, Miss Henry, especially since you recognized us. Quit whimpering. If I'd aim to hit you, I'd have hit you. All right, Ellen. Get off my land and stay off. Just don't you get in any trouble with that rifle, Ellen. I expect you'll hear about it if I do, Marshal. Now get. I don't always aim high. Come on, Chester. How old would you say she is, Mr. Dillon? Oh, she can't be over 40, I guess. If that. She looks like an old woman. 60 or more. She's dried up. Dead inside. Remember when Ethan and her and the boy came out here, Mr. Dillon, right after the war? She's an awful pretty little thing. Mm-hmm. Luther was a little more than a baby then. No, Mr. Dillon, I was just thinking. Ethan was so proud of his homestead and his boy and Ellen. Now he's five years dead, the boy's gone bad, and his wife and his homestead, they've just dried up. It's kind of sad, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Well, come on, Chester, let's get on into Dodge. <laughs> Oh, Mitch. Well, what'll it be? Uh, set up a bottle of rye, will you? Yes, sir, Marshal Dillon. <laughs> Look. There's Luther over there at the table, alone. Yeah, I saw him. <clears throat> well, thanks, Mitch. Wait here, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, Mitch, could I have a little sugar in here? Mm. 
Mind if I don't get to my feet, Marshal? I got the feeling if I tried to stand up straight, I'd fall over first thing I knew. Sit still, Luther. I just don't have a lot of choice about it, Marshal. I was out by your place this morning, Luther. I hadn't seen your mother in a long time. Wish I could say the same. A woman shouldn't have to run a homestead alone. Not when her son's big enough to be a real help. Is this a lecture, Marshal? A do-good talk? Put your own name on it, Luther. I can't make you feel what you don't feel. But in a way, you're responsible for your mother and what she does. I'm real lucky, Marshal. I can quit listening any time I don't want to hear something. Between the old lady and people like you, I quit listening an awful lot. Get it straight, Luther. I don't care what happens to you. I done something wrong? You accusing me of something unlawful, Marshal? No. But if you have any feeling left for your mother or what happens to her, you'll do something about her. Living out there alone so much, she's gone a little crazy. <laughs> she shot at you. <laughs> Is that all that's concerning you, Marshal? Half the time I do go home, she levels off at me. I got a ride in under fire. Or crawl in on my belly. She's crazy, like you said. That's why she's crazy. Then you ought to bring her into town. Get a keeper for her. Maybe I would. If I cared what happened to her. I don't care. I don't care at all. Well, that's up to you, Luther. Now, that's just another one of them things I didn't hear you say, Marshal. Well, Luther's just plain drunk, isn't he, sir? That and just plain no good. Well, whatever you said drove him right out of here, Mr. Dillon. Mm-hmm. Well, we haven't been in the office since early yesterday, Chester. All right, sir. Only... Only what? Well, sir, Mitch has got a catalog in the back room, and he's not busy, and he says it's just full of things you can order straight from St. Louis. And I thought I'd... Well... Uh, you got extra money, <laughs> Chester? Oh, no, sir. Well, that is not really extra money, Mr. Dillon. It's just that... Well... Mitch swears you can get underwear from this catalog that don't rub your skin raw, and I'd like to take a look at it. <laughs> All right, Chester, I'll wait. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, uh, Marshal. Uh, oh, hello, Cass. Now, what's on your mind? Talk I heard, Marshal. It's uh, private, like maybe we'd go to your office. We can do our talking here. I thought you was always of a mind to get me inside there, Marshal, where you could turn the key on me. Maybe I will someday, Cass. Now, come on, speak up. Yeah, I heard talk at Luther Henry Road cattle off Carnes place last night. I saw you talking with him just now. I wondered if you'd heard the same. I haven't heard a thing, Cass. Odd, you wouldn't know. I was out of Dodge last night, all night. Uh... I wonder if it's so. L Luther didn't give himself away when you talked just now. You're the one who's heard the talk, Cass. I got my rights. I can ask questions of you, Marshal. If a man's heard ain't safe, he's got a right to know. Are you worried for Carnes or for you? If Carnes' cattle can be rode off, mine can. No. I didn't know you had much of a herd. What a man has is his own business, Marshal. I'm asking about Luther and the other rider. They say there was two. If Luther's wrong with the law, I'll get him. Is there anything else on your mind? Thanks, Mitch, for letting me see the book. Not a thing, Marshal. But I don't much like your attitude. I can't see that worry in me too much, Cass. All right, Chester, let's go. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon, I was watching him from the back there. He's a sniveling sort, that cast. Mm-hmm. Come to think of it, though, I don't know a single bad thing he's done. 
Know any good he's done? No, sir. Can't say that he do, Mr. Dillon. How about you, Did you Find out about your fancy underwear. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, now we can tend to business, huh? Come on. Hello, Marshal. I was waiting for you. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carnes. Howdy, Chester. Well, how do, Mr. Carnes? You got the key, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, I don't see you in town much, Mr. Carnes. Only when I got business, Marshal. Yeah. Well, come on in, won't you? My, it's close in here. <laughs> We've been away a day and a night, Mr. Carnes. Sure gets close that way. I'll just open up the back. Won't you have a chair, Mr. Carnes? I don't have a long piece to say, Marshal. It don't take long to say some of my cattle were stolen last night. Yeah, I heard. So soon? Yeah, Cass Stetter told me about it a few minutes ago. Hmm. Well, I don't know how Cass come by the information, but it's true. This is the second time it's happened in the last few weeks. You don't keep much cattle, do you? Hardly any. I suppose a hundred heads is the most I ever had at one time. Mm Mm-hmm. But last night I lost five or six... About the same time before. Cass was of the mind that uh, Luther Henry did it. I don't know, Marshal. One of my hands said Luther was out of my place the other day just looking around. I got no real reason to suspect him. Only thing I know is that whoever it was rides a horse that's shot all the way around. You don't see a lot of that on the prairie. No, you don't. Do you think there was just one rider, Mr. Carnes? There was two from the tracks, but the boys and me lost them in the rain. I thought I'd tell you about it, Marshal. I can't afford to lose a little I got. No, I'll do what I can, Mr. Kern. I... I kind of hope it isn't Luther. Not for him so much as Ellen. She's had enough trouble. Yeah. Well, Chester and I'll ride out to the Henry place and look around, Mr. Carnes. If uh, Luther's guilty, maybe some of Ellen's troubles will be over. Or maybe they'll just be beginning... Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, in the 17th annual poll of Noted Daily, CBS Radio won 12 first places. The top poll award, Champion of Champions, went to The Jack Benny Show. Best comedian was Eve Arden on Our Miss Brooks. Best comedian, Jack Benny. Best master of ceremonies, Bing Crosby. Bing also won the nod as best popular male vocalist. Doris Day was rated best feminine pop vocalist. And so it went in all 12 first places. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Where, Mr. Dillon, I feel like I was riding right into the camp of the enemy, coming back to Ellen this way. <laughs> you think we should be flying a white flag as we ride up, Chester? Well, I'd feel a little safer to tell the honest truth. Uh, she's got no reason to fire on us. <laughs> but I'll agree, that's a pretty small comfort. Oh. Look yonder, Mr. Dillon. I think I saw her peering out. It's all right, Chester. Come on. <laughs> I don't see Luther's horse around. Maybe he isn't here. Well? Afternoon, Ellen. I uh, want to talk a bit about uh, Luther. I got work to do in the shed. I'm going there. You want to talk. Let me help, Ellen. I'll get it. Hmm. 
Well, he's got a loose shoe. I aim to fix it. Well, we could be a hand, Ellen. If, yes, uh... I'm proud to. I aim to fix it myself. All right. He wouldn't have shoes if I waited for a man to shoe him. Easy. Easy, Dal. Easy. Oh. You come to talk, Marshal. Yeah, about Luther. Come on. Open. Huh. Two nails clean out. No wonder it's loose. Carnes lost some cattle last night. Two riders got off with five or six head. One of Carnes' hands thinks Luther was one of them. Is he around, Ellen? I told you before. He comes and goes, Luther does. Well, have you seen him since we were here this morning? Don't recall that I have, Marshal. I got other things to occupy my thought. Like trying to get together enough money to go back to my people. What to do with those nails? Here they are, man. Oh. I'd admire to help you, Miss Henry. I'll do it. That's a fine horse, Ellen. A real fine horse. Shot all the way around. Come on, boy. That was Ethan's way. This your horse or uh, Luther's? Mine. What? Well, that was Luther, Mr. Dillon, and he took your horse. Yeah. Will I make a run after him, sir? Not when he's wild, Chester. I don't want you shot or him either. I just want to talk to him. Well, he just comes and goes, huh, Ellen? Believe what you want, Marshal. I didn't know he was around. Like I said, I never know. Quit caring. Don't worry, Marshal. Luther will get his. He's had it coming to him for a long time. Well, I guess we ride back double, Chester. Yes, sir, we sure do. Luther sure cut out quick, Mr. Dillon. Maybe he did run those cattle off Carn's place last night. Maybe. He's running away from something. Wonder where he'll hide. Everybody around here knows your horse. Oh, he's made a lot of mistakes. He'll make more. Nothing says he's going to turn bright all of a sudden. You're not worried about your horse then, Mr. Dillon? I don't think so, Chester. What kind of a woman is that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen? Yes, sir. I don't know. I'm not much of a hand to understand women, Chester, any woman. I don't know. You think she knew Luther was home all along? Maybe. I just don't understand it, Mr. Dillon. It's not right somehow, a woman not caring about her own son. You hear her? She said right out, I quit caring. It just don't seem right. Still might close in here. I believe I'll leave them back windows up a spell, Mr. Dillon. I think I'll go up to Emil's blacksmith shop, Chester, and see if he has a horse to spare. All right, sir. Uh, there's some paperwork to catch up on if you get the time. Yes, sir. Of course, you'll want to write that place in Chicago about your underwear, the first thing. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> I'll be back, Chester. Uh, well, I may not need that horse after all. How's that, Mr. Dillon? Ellen Henry's riding up the street, leading my horse. Well, bless my soul, it sure is. There's something thrown across her saddle. Mr. Dillon, it looks like... Wait here, Chester. Hello, Ellen. 
I brought your horse back, Marshal. He's been run hard. He looks all right. You, uh... You found Luther, did you? He's dead. You found him dead? He had it coming a long time. Here, I'll lift him down. Chester! Easy. Easy, Daryl. Easy. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon? Uh, Chester, take the body up to docks, will you? Yes, sir. Miss Henry, I... I'm real sorry. I'll be going now, Marshal. Well, I'll take my horse then, Ellen. You, uh... You got any plans for... Barry and Luther? Put him in any ground you like, only... Don't tell me where it is or when you do it. You know how he died, Ellen? He was shot. Look, it's near dark, Ellen. You could put up in town for the night if uh, you'd... Don't put him near Ethan, Marshal. I wouldn't want that. Cut off! Doc's working on Luther now, Mr. Dillon. He's just plumb full of holes. Yeah, I know. Poor Miss Henry. Even though she don't act like it, I just know she feels terrible. Yeah, she's grieving her heart on. Where are you going, Mr. Dillon? I don't think I express my sympathy to poor Miss Henry. Proper. Good <laughs> I followed Ellen Henry West toward her homestead. The sun was down now, but I could see her ahead riding hard. There were clouds to the south and the smell of rain on the easy wind that blew in little circles around me. Ellen bore west, and I lost her past a clump of cottonwoods near Carnes' place, so I rode harder. When I came even with the trees, there was just enough sun ray left to see her head south toward the dark clouds. She wasn't going home. It was dark now. I couldn't see anything. The storm clouds stretched black from the south and fastened over half the sky. And I rode hard against them till I saw the flicker of lantern shine ahead. It was Cass Stetter's place. I left my horse out away from the house and walked in as softly as I could. Cass and Ellen were having their talk in a cattle shed near the You've house. You've trusted me before about the money, Ellen. What's the rush this time? My work's done, Cass. It was done last night when Luther and me drove them last few from Carnes' place over here. I want my share and Luther's. Him not cold dead yet, you want a share. Ain't a mother entitled to whatever her son leaves? Mother. You never had no mother feel for him and him no love for you either. Ha! Huh. Ain't you the one to talk about love, though. It takes courage to love. To love with all of you. When the love goes, they take it and bury it in the ground. There's nothing left but hate. I wouldn't kill my own kin. You wouldn't be that honest. You won't even steal cattle yourself buy it off of them as has the courage to ride in and rustle Yeah, well, how'd it feel killing your own Ellen? Like it'll feel killing you, Cass, if you don't give me the money here and now, like nothing at all. Luther's dead and gone because he tipped his hand, showed his face around Carnes' place, talked big in the saloons. He was no use. No use at all. There's no woman in you at all. I've been dead five years. And your time's running short, too, Cass. I'm in a hurry. Too late to hurry, Ellen. What's he... Too late to move for gun, so. Well, I'm sure glad to see you, Marshal. 
How are you, Cass? Oh, I sure am. I uh, guess I called a trick on Luther, all right, didn't I? Yeah, you were a big help. You and Luther stole the cattle all and then brought them to Cass for pay, is that it? Only sometimes, like now, we didn't get paid. Don't believe her, Marshal. You wouldn't take the word of one as murders your own son, would you? I don't have to, Cass. Karn's brand won't be hard to find on any cattle you got here. Cass was just slow to move him on, Marshal. If he'd have gone on toward Abilene mm. with him last night like we planned... You're lying, Helen Henry, you're lying. Now get your horses. Both of you. Wait. Well, why are you taking me, Marshal? Well, there's some kind of a law, Cass, about buying and transporting stolen cattle. Yeah, Marshal knows his law, Cass. Did you... You know what she did to Luther, don't you, Marshal? Yeah, I know. Now, come on. You'd like it better, wouldn't you, Marshal? If one of us made a move so you could use your gun. I said, come on, Ellen. I think I'd like it better if you used your gun, Marshal. I ain't going to get back east now anyway. You'd be taking a coward's way out, Ellen, if you made me kill you. Ah. <coughs> I said, get your horse, Cass. <laughs> now make your choice, Ellen. But I don't think Ethan would think much of you. All right, Marshal. I'll go. But mind what I said. Don't put Luther near Ethan. They wasn't the same kind. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Kathleen Height, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Sam Edwards, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Herb Vigran. Parley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This coming Monday evening, hear Richard Widmark as one of the desperate Spencer brothers riding against time and death in a suspense drama well calculated to keep your interest high. Also Monday night, you want to hear CBS Radio's Lux Radio Theater starring Joan Fontaine and Joseph Cotton in the strange drama September Affair. Remember, both this Monday night on most of these same CBS Radio stations. Suspense and Lux Radio Theater. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network.
Dodge City and at the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Cleanliness is next to godliness, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, I know, Chester, but all you're doing is getting it off the floor into the air. Man can hardly breathe in here. All right, Mr. Dillon. I'll do my sweeping later. Yeah, good. My mother taught me that, Mr. Dillon. Taught you what, Chester? That cleanliness is next to godliness. She was a fine woman, too. Oh, look, Chester, it's a good saying, and it's probably true, and I got nothing against your mother except that she also should have taught you how to sweep. Well, maybe she just didn't have the time, Mr. Dillon. You see, there was an awful lot of us, and oh, what with chores Matt. and... Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, come on, uh, I'll buy you a drink. Uh, what? Doc said he'd buy you a drink, Mr. Dillon. He really said that? You coming? <laughs> Doc, you got to quit throwing your money around the way you do. Uh, maybe you don't need a drink. Uh, no, wait a minute, Doc. I, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you all about it when I get back, Chester. I'd be mighty interested, Mr. Dillon. Oh, sure be glad when it gets winter again. Why, Doc? You'll just complain about the cold, then. Oh, uh, I suppose... You go sit with Kitty, Matt. I'll bring a bottle. Okay, Doc. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Matt. What are you and Doc up to? Yeah, he wants someone to talk to, so he picked me. And you. Fine. I'm a good listener. Lots of practice. <laughs> What are we celebrating? Uh, let's see here. We'll drink to a fellow that you don't know. Uh-huh. Kane Vestal. Well, here's to him. Yeah? Here's to him. <coughs> yes, he'll be dead in a couple of months. What? That's what I told him. What do you mean, Doc? Well, I'm not the only one who's told him that. I'm just the last. Well... Who is this Kane Vestal, Doc? Oh, he's just a fella. Came in on the train last night, leaving for Arizona to my die in Arizona. He's a musician. He plays the guitar, he tells me. Well, how's he gonna die? Consumption. He's got it bad. I'm the last doctor he's gonna ask about it, he says. Oh, poor fella. Yes, yeah, climb it out there, keep him going for a little while longer. And, uh, oh, I don't know, he's... He's such a sad man for some reason. Well, who wouldn't be, Doc? No, 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 Kitty. I think Kane's been sad for a long, long time. He's a very nice fellow, too. Nothing can help him, huh? No, nothing. You know, it's a funny thing, Doc, huh? I'm just sitting here thinking. Sometimes you have to tell men they're going to die. Sometimes I have to. Yeah, that's all right, man. Oh, let's see. Uh, there he is. See that fellow with the car there? He just came in. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he knows anyone around here. You mind if I ask him over? Well, sure. 
your party, Doc. Oh, good. Uh, uh, Kane? Uh, Kane? Uh, over here? Uh. <laughs> ah, sit down. Sit down. Kane, this is Kitty. Uh, hello, Kane. Kitty. <laughs> this is Marshal Dillon. Hello, Marshal. Pleasure to meet you. He's doing it here. Sit down. There we are. Have a drink. Well, thank you, Doc. Uh, this your first trip west, Kane? Yes, Marshal, it is. Oh, well, where are you from? No place in particular, Miss Kitty. I seem to spend most of my life on the Mississippi River. Well, I, I thought you were a musician. I am. I was hired to ride the river boats and play my guitar for the passengers. Oh. <laughs> Well, at least you've had a constant change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> After 20 years of going up and down that river, it got pretty familiar, Marshal. <laughs> well, Kane, I knew a young fellow back in St. Louis for the war, and he was learning to be a river pilot. <laughs> Say, I wonder if you ever ran into him. Name of Clemens, Sam Clemens? No, Doc, I don't believe I did. Oh, he was a very amusing fella. He was just chock full of stories. Um, you leaving Dodge tomorrow, Kane? I'm headed for Arizona, Miss Kitty. No reflection on Dodge, though. <laughs> uh, if you hit a place out there called Tombstone, I uh, wish you'd look up Virgil Earp for me. Uh, tell him I sent you, huh? Thanks, Marshal. I'll do that. Say, Kane, I wonder, uh, could I ask you a favor? Well, certainly, Miss Kitty, anything at all. Well, would you play something for us? I had an idea that's what it would be. <laughs> Anything in particular? Oh, play something you like, Kane. Another girl I knew used to like this one. Kitty. I wish you were going to stay here a while. Maybe you could teach me to play like that. Huh? It'd be a pleasure, Miss Kitty. But I'm afraid I won't be around for long. Morning, Mr. Dillon. It's uh, noon, Chester. Yes, sir, I know, but you went off with Doc yesterday, so I figured I had a little time coming today. Well, that depends on how you spent it. Now, if you've been gambling, oh, I am... now, Mr. Dillon, you know I never gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I was out helping a fellow learn to shoot a six-gun, that's all. Now? You mean there's a man in Dodge who doesn't know how? This fellow don't. Never had one in his hand before. He's a musician. What? It plays the guitar, he told me. You mean Kane? Uh, Kane Vestal? Yeah, sir, that's his name. Nice a fellow as you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. But he was supposed to leave on the stage this morning. And what's he done with his six-gun anyway? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dillon. He just come by here early this morning and asked me if I'd teach him. Yeah. Now, where'd he get the gun? Said he'd just bought it. Anything wrong, Mr. Dillon? No, no. 
just doesn't add up somehow, that's all. Oh, well, he won't cause any trouble. He's not the sort. Uh, you never know, Chester. Mm, no, sir. My kitty looks pretty this morning. She's got a yellow parasol, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? All right, I think I'll go see her for a minute. Uh, I'll be right back, Chester. Yes, yeah, sir, Mr. Dillon. Kitty? Uh, hello, Matt. <laughs> Kitty, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Oh, sure. What is it? Uh... I'm curious about something, Kitty. Maybe you can help me. Maybe. How long was Kane Vessel with you yesterday? Kane? Oh, well, he didn't leave till evening. Why? Well, he didn't go out on the stage this morning, and he's bought himself a six-gun. You, you any idea why? A gun? Huh? Doesn't sound like Kane. Anything happened yesterday, Kitty, or did he tell you anything? Oh, well, yeah, might... there was one thing, Matt. Joel Adams and a couple of his men came in. Yeah. Kane got pretty upset when he saw him had a bad coughing spell. Oh? Uh-huh. Later, he asked a lot of questions about Adams. Well, what'd you tell him? Just that Adams is a big landowner around here that nobody who isn't working for him likes him very much. That's all I know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk, Adams and Kane. No. I don't think they even know each other. Well, anyway, he sure isn't the sort to be packing a gun. Well, you'll just get into trouble, Matt. Yeah. Uh, where's he staying, did he say? Dodge house, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kitty. I'll see you later. Come in. Hello, Kane. Well, Marshal Dillon. Come in, come in. Ah, oh, thank you. <clears throat> what can I do for you, Marshal? I, uh, I thought you were leaving Dodge on the stage this morning. Well, I was, Marshal, but I changed my mind. You know how it is. Sure, Kane, sure. Now, we're glad to have you around. I, uh, I'm just curious, though. You're, uh... Stay and have anything to do with that gun you bought this morning? Oh, Chester told you. I thought he would. He's a good teacher, Marshal. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't answer my question. Do I have to answer it? I'm just trying to help you, that's all. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Marshal, but I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. Look, Kane, you're new in this country. A man like you just can't pick up a six-gun and call himself a fighting man. Not and expect to live through it. I certainly lay no claim to be a fighting man. Well, then why did you buy that gun? There's no law out here against a man having a gun, is there, Marshal? No. But any man who carries one is expected to use it when the time comes. You'd be a lot safer without one. Being safe doesn't mean a whole lot to me, Marshal. Not now. Yeah, I, I know. Doc told me. What's it all about? It's a long story. And an old one, I suppose. I'd really rather not talk about it. Well, I can't force you to. But, but tell me this. Does it have anything to do with Joel Adams? Yes, it does, Marshal. I'm going to kill him. When? I don't know. Any time. Well, why? That's a long story I mentioned. All right, Kane. But if you try to face him, he'll kill you before you got that gun halfway out of your belt. And if you shoot him any other way, you'll hang for it. You've forgotten something, Marshal. What? No matter what I do, I'm going to die soon anyway. 
month or two isn't going to make any difference. You hate Adams that much? I wouldn't kill a man I didn't hate, would I? I didn't think you were the sort of man who'd kill anyone. Only Joel Adams, Marshal. Then I gotta warn him about you. Well, I understand, Marshal. It's all right. He doesn't know me anyway. Never even saw me before. But you want to kill him? Yes, sir. Well, I'll take your gun away from you, but you'll just find another one. And I can't arrest you unless I catch you trying to bushwhack him. I'm sorry for the trouble I'm causing you, Marshal. You know, I've never had to deal with a man like you before, King. Maybe I ought to just tie you up and throw you on that stage. You could. But I'd just come right back. <sighs> I guess you would. I'm sorry this has to happen here in Dodge, Marshal. Then why don't you leave? I guess I hate Joel Adams too much. All right, Kane, I'm through trying to convince you. So long. Bye, Marshal. Marshal, and I never saw him before last night. You must have known him somewhere, Adams. You're trying to make me out a liar, Marshal. I'm trying to save Kane's life and yours, maybe. No, he ain't gonna shoot me. I'll kill him first time he looks sideways. Maybe you won't see him. Oh? Shoot me in the back, eh? Well, in that case, it... In that case, what? Why, nothing, Dylan, nothing. Forget it. If Kane's shot in the back, you'll be the first man I'd take in, Adam. I don't even know him. Why should I shoot him? I'm only warning you. Well, just leave me be, Marshal. I can take care of myself. See that you do, Adams, and only yourself. Why, sure, Marshal. Only I don't much like the idea of some stranger gunning for me. Makes me sort of uneasy. There must be some reason for it. Don't start it again, Marshal. Ain't no reason. I know. You've led a blameless life. You never hurt anyone, I you, told you twice. There are men I'll around here who'd shoot you on sight if they thought they could get by with it. I don't think you were ever any good, Adam, so don't tell me that Kane's got no reason. I don't You're believe it. You're pushing me now, Marshal. I'm tired of your talk, that's all. Maybe it's true you don't know him, but he sure knows something about you. Well, then he'll wish you didn't. That's all I got to say. Well, just keep out of his way. Give it a little time, and maybe there won't be any killing at all. Why, sure, sure. All the time in the world. All right, Adams. I've done all I can. Just don't worry about me. I'm not. Then goodbye, Marshal. Goodbye. Return for the second act of Gun Smoke in just a moment. But first, the poignant story of Jane Froman, adapted from the movie with a song in my heart, was selected by you listeners through a national magazine as the one you would like most to hear on Lux Radio Theater. So this Monday night, listen for Susan Hayward, Rory Calhoun, David Wayne, Thelma Ritter, and Bob Wagner of the movie cast when CBS Radio presents Lux Radio Theater. Now, the second act of Gun Smoke. Sure is quiet around town tonight, Mr. Dillon. There's a trail herd due in a couple of days. I suppose business will pick up then. Mm. You'd think those cowboys be too tuckered out after a ride like that to have any juice left in them at all, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> yeah, they're too poor to cut loose any other time. Well, that don't stop them down in Texas, Mr. Dillon. No? No. It's just like an uncle of mine back in Waco. He was poor. Oh, he was mean poor. But he always said the only good money was was to have fun with. 
Oh, did he have fun? But no, sir. He was too poor, like I said. <laughs> All right, Chester. All right. All I ask is that you don't try to explain it to me. <laughs> well, but there's nothing to explain, Mr. Dillon. It, it's just uh, it's just that he was the Chester. one poorest Chester. man you'd ever... Uh, Marshal, say, you want to talk to Kane Bestel? What? Uh, Kane is upstairs in my office. He been shot? No, no, not shot. Beat up. Well, how is he, Doc? Well, he's not too bad. A couple of cowboys found him just outside of town. They heard a shot and said two men rode off before they could stop them. Yeah? And I guess whoever it was, they didn't have time to finish the job. They just got started working on it. So Adams made the first move, huh? Uh, I'll be back soon, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> they hit him on the head with a gun butt and scratched him up some. Outside of that, he's fine. That's uh, still assault, even if they didn't kill him, Doc. Yeah, I suppose it is. Anyway, they took a shot at him when they heard those riders coming along. Went right through his coat. Yeah. They probably think he's dead. So that's where you went, Doc. I might have known. Didn't even give you a chance to use that gun, did he, Kane? I didn't have a gun on me, Marshal, but it wasn't he. It was they. Huh? Do you recognize them? Well, I don't know many people around here. You know Joel Adams, or so you told me. It wasn't Adams. Could you pick him out if you saw him again? No, Mar Marshal, I don't believe I could. Where were you when they grabbed you, Kane? Into Front Street. I was taking a walk after supper. They rode up behind me, one on each side, lifted me up, and mm -hmm. carried me out of town a ways. You must have got a good look at them, at least when they got off their horses. It was too dark, Marshal. Yeah. Doc, how long has he been here? Oh, about half an hour, Marshal. I... Those cowboys who saw you, Kane, they brought you right in here, didn't they? Yes. So it was maybe an hour ago when those two men hauled you out of town? It was plenty light enough then. Was it, Marshal? You're going to fight it yourself, aren't you? Yes, Marshal. It... <laughs> it's my affair. It was, Kane, but you've been assaulted and shot at, so it's the law's business now. I won't prefer any charges, Marshal. You don't have to. I've seen you, and I know who did it or who hired it done as well as you oh, do. Please, Marshal, i got to handle this my own way. There's a law that says you can't murder a man, Kane, and the same law says he can't murder you. Are you so full of hate you can't get that through your head? I guess that's it, Marshal. All right, Kane. You do what you have to do. So will I. Hello, Adams. I've been looking for you. It's late, Dylan. Can't you see me tomorrow? It's not even midnight. That's early for you. <laughs> you see how this marshal's always trying to get me on the prod, boys? Yes, sir. Yes. These boys of yours play pretty rough themselves, Adams. Meaning? Didn't they tell you? Tell me what? What they did to Kane Vestal? They did not kill Kane Vestal, and you can't prove it. No, Adams, I can't. Kane isn't even dead. What? You know, I'm curious, Adams. Why do you think he might be? Why, why, if somebody said he got himself hurt. Joel Adams. You arranged this, Marshal? You know I didn't. Who is he? What does he want? Hello, Joel Adams. Don't strain yourself so you don't know me. Who are you? Kane Vestal. But my name doesn't matter. What are you haunting me for? I never saw you before in my life. That's true. You didn't. But we had a friend in common once. A friend? Who? Julie Travis. What about Julie? You were a riverboat gambler then, Adams, and you had money and fine clothes and a way with women, especially young girls. Julie was only 16 at the time. Never mind all that. 
So she went away with you to be married, you told her. Oh. <laughs> I think I guessed the rest. You wanted to marry her, but I got her instead. Is that it? That's it, Adam. <laughs> That's exactly it. Oh, no, I thought you really had something on your mind, Vestal. Well, all right, why don't you get out of here and quit bothering people while you can still walk? Julie killed herself, Adam. She committed suicide. What? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Because you never married her after all. It was just a year after you abandoned her in New Orleans. I think it has a lot to do with you, Joel Adams. What are your plans, mister? I see you got a gun in your belt. Gonna kill you. Oh, so? When? Now. Right now. All right, Vestal, draw. Leave the gun where it is, Kane. One thing I always promised myself, Adams. Is someday I'd spit in your face. Why, you don't... Give me the gun, Adams. He's dead. Well, he was going to kill me. You heard him. He wanted you dead, Adams, any way he could manage. I know it. That's what I say. You're under arrest for murder. For... What... It was a gunfight. He never even moved for his gun. Well, then I'll hang for this. He couldn't have got me any other way. No, don't suppose he could have. I remember the river gamblers used to say, don't matter how you win so long as you win. That Kane should have been a gambler. Maybe he was. Come on, let's go. Gunsmoke. Transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. And now for a special announcement. There have been many requests for information regarding our theme. It's called Old Trail and was written especially for us by Rex Corey, our musical director. If you will write to Gunsmoke in care of your local CBS radio station, we will try to give you whatever specific information you may desire. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations hear William Powell in a startling anti-communist drama titled The Man Who Cried Wolf. Remember to hear Suspense, starring William Powell, on most of these same CBS radio stations this Monday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network.
from Dodge City entered the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Could I give you some more coffee? Uh, yeah, I guess so. How about you, Chester? Yes, sir, I believe I will. Uh, why don't you just leave the coffee pot here on the table, Miss Keller? Why, sure thing, Marshal. Right. Well, I got some fresh eggs this morning, if you're interested. They oh. were just brought in. Well, good, good. Uh, cook us up about a half a dozen of them, huh? Have them for you right away, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> All right. Fresh eggs, my. I'll swear if Del Monaco's ain't getting to be about as fancy as some of them Kansas City restaurants. <laughs> well, that's civilization, Chester. Progress. Another five years, and Dodge City will be tamed, curried, and bridled. <laughs> see and believe it, Mr. Dillon. Well, you'll see it. Both of us will see it. That is, if we live that long. Yeah. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Uh, you Mr. Yeah? Dillon, the marshal here? Ah, uh, yes, that's right. Well, I'm sorry to bother you at breakfast, marshal. My name is Hunter. Ed Hunter. Mr. Hunter? I'm a deputy sheriff from Richmond, Virginia. Come in on the Santa Fe this morning. I see. Well, uh, why don't you pull up a chair, Mr. Hunter? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Chester Proudfoot, Mr. Hunter. How do you do? How do you do, sir? So here's my first trip to the frontier. I find it a rather remarkable experience. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, won't you have some coffee? I uh, know, thank you. Marshal, I'm here to arrest two men who are wanted in Virginia. No? Here are the warrants and the orders of extradition. I stopped off for them in Topeka. Uh-huh. Yeah. John Allison, Calvin Moore. Both wanted for murder, huh? Hey, do you know these men, Mr. Hunter? No, sir, I don't. Well, the names aren't familiar to me. I never heard of them. Have you a Chester? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. Well, I have some information that may help. Not much on Allison, I'm afraid. He shot and killed a bank teller at Greenbrier last spring. Oh? He's about 30 years old, dark hair and mustache, medium build, an excellent horseman and a confirmed gambler. <laughs> Well, that's fine. That narrows it down to about two-thirds of the men in Dodge City. <laughs> well, possibly I can do a bit better in regard to Calvin Moore, Mr. Dillon. Now, he came down to Richmond from the north and set up practice as a medical doctor. He was about 29 at the time. And he ambushed and shot young Roger Beauregard and then left town. That uh -huh. was uh, 17 years ago. Beauregard's been trying to trace him ever since. Well, I'm afraid that's a pretty well, long time. Well, I have a picture of Moore, photograph. Oh? Uh -huh. Of course, he was much younger than this. Oh, well, sometimes there's still quite a resemblance, even after 70. Something familiar about that picture, Mr. Dillon? Uh, uh, 17 years. He must be somewhere past 45 now, huh? Hmm. Are you sure that these men are here in Dodge, Mr. Hunter? Reasonably so. Is there something about that photograph that makes you... Well, it's, it's too blurred to tell much about it. Besides, he'd be 17 years older now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Hunter, suppose you leave the picture and the descriptions with me, and I'll check around town, and I'll keep in touch with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, I wonder if you might suggest a good hotel. Uh, certainly. Why don't you try the Dodge House? It's the corner of Railroad Avenue at the end of the plaza, the east end. Uh, tell the deacon I sent you. I uh, thank you again, Mr. Dillon. And I'll be grateful for any help you can give me in this matter. Yeah, sure. So long. You want to see the photograph, Chester? Yes, sir, I do. Well, Mr. Dillon, that is... That is... Yeah. What are you going to do, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. I... He's my friend. I, I, I never asked him anything about his life before he came here. It didn't seem to matter. But now the law says he's a murderer. And I'm part of the law. So now it does matter. Maybe it's not him. No, it's him, all right, Chester. 
You saw it the same as I did. It's dark. This is the first chance I've had this week to clean a few instruments properly. Uh, gunshot wounds. Oh, Matt. I'll lay odds I'm the only doctor in the United States who makes three-fourths of his living off of gunshot wounds. <laughs> That's a rough country, Doc. Yes, indeed it's a rough country. Uh, maybe you ought to have stayed back east. Huh? Yeah, see, broken bones, babies, and gunshot wounds. Well, I wouldn't know the first thing about a good civilized case of gout anymore. Uh, what part of the East did you come from, Doc? You see, I went to medical school in Boston. I studied consumption, colic, liver complaints. <laughs> Never had a case of liver complaint in all the time I've been here, though. No, I guess that kind of thing is more common down south, around uh, Richmond, Virginia, for instance, huh? <clears throat> Man, stop beating around the bush. You've got something on your mind, and it's bothering you. Look, Doc, uh, a deputy sheriff from Virginia came in on the morning train. He's got a warrant for murder against a man named Calvin Moore. He's got a photograph of Moore taken 17 years ago. Would you like to look at it? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Are you Calvin Moore? It wasn't murder, Matt. They said it was murder, of course. The Beauregards were an important family. Would you like to tell me about it? Oh, not much to tell, Matt. I had been in practice in Richmond about a year. There was a girl, a beautiful girl, with spirit and fire and that soft radiance that only southern girls seem to have. And, you know, me, that was so long ago. Uh -huh. I've been in the South myself now. Roger Beauregard and I were both caught in this girl. He was a typical Virginia gentleman, hot-headed, used to having his own way. He started threatening me, warning me. And I laughed it off. Then one day I was coming back from a case, and I ran into Roger on a country road. He had a pair of dueling pistols, and he challenged me. What? Well, that's not a crime, Doc. That's self-defense. It's not a crime here or anywhere. Well, I tried to talk him out of it, but he was crazy mad. He shoved one of the pistols in my hand, and he pulled back on his horse, and he leveled his gun. I had no choice. We both fired. He missed. I didn't. Self-defense, yes, but there were no witnesses, and I was an outsider, a Yankee. So you ran for it, is that it? I ran for it. St. Louis, Virginia City... Montana Territory, the Panhandle, Wichita, Abilene, and Dodge. I changed my name to Charles Adams. And the, uh, the girl, Doc, what happened to her? I waited for her in St. Louis. We were married there. Two months later, she died of typhoid fever. Well, you never know. No matter how much you figure you understand somebody, you just quite never know. I can't go back there, Matt. I've got no defense. It, well, I'd mean prison. I'd rot in prison. I, I won't go back, Matt. Now, Doc, look, Hunter is here after two prisoners. I got no right to, to my own rules to go after one man and keep the other one covered. I always figured that the only kind of law that would work out here is an honest law. What are you going to do? Doc, I don't know. You're late, Matt. I decided you weren't going to stop in tonight. Is Chester around? Kid? Yeah, over there by the faro table. No. Matt, what about this Virginian who's been hanging around for the last two days? Oh, Hunter? Yeah. He's a deputy sheriff, got a couple of warrants to serve. Why? 
Well, he's been asking questions. Some of the boys are getting a little skittish. Now, there's no call for it as long as they're not named Allison or Moore. Are you free now, Miss Kitty, huh? or are you busy? What's it look like? Well, I figured maybe he was just killing time. Uh, hiya, Marshal. Bunko? Uh, bought you a drink, Kitty. It's over on the bar. All right. Thanks. Matt, I'll be off in a couple of hours. Drop around. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I understand you've got a rival lawman in town, Marshal. Well, there's a deputy here from Virginia, if that's what you mean. I always figured you were the law here. Is he short in this town, Marshal? Say the word, we'll run him out. I ever ask you for help, Bunko? Well, no. But... When a man's short in Dodge, I'll run him out. And no offense, Marshal. You keep your own cinch tight. Don't worry about anybody else, huh? I'll see you, Bunko. I swear I never saw anybody such bad luck in all my life. My gracious, he ought to swear off Pharaoh and stick this dud. Oh, Chester. Hmm? The old Jethro Keener, he just lost three weeks' pay. And Bunko Benson, sitting right there beside him, mind you, picked up $230. Uh, so that's why he's feeling big. Uh, come on, Chester, let's take a walk. Huh? Yes, sir. Three weeks' pay. Mercy, I never saw such luck. What about Doc, Chester? He turned in a couple of hours ago. That's when I came on over here. How's he acting? About as usual. No signs of planning to run out, if that's what you mean, Mr. Dunn. One thing he's doing, though, that he's never done before, he's toting a gun. Uh, good evening, Marshal. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Hunter. Since you didn't come to me, Mr. Dillon, I've come to you. I'm wondering what progress you've made. Well, I, uh, I'm still checking. Any results at all, Marshal? Well, I don't have much to go on, you know. Now, Calvin Moore was a doctor by profession. He might still be practicing. I suggest we investigate the local doctors. Well, that wouldn't take long. We've only got one, Doc Adams. How long has he been here? Oh, about four years. How old a man is he? Mm, late 40s, I imagine. But he doesn't show much resemblance to that photograph you gave me. Well, maybe you're too used to him to notice the resemblance. Yeah, maybe. I'd like to look him over myself, Marshal. Well, uh, he's pretty busy out on calls most of the time. and uh... Not all the time. No, not all the time. All right, Mr. Hunter, I'll bring him around. <laughs> That's funny, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he should have answered by now. Well, we're wasting our time, Chester. He's gone. Well, now, he, he, he might have got called out on a case. Yeah, I know, but I don't... Hey, what? Uh, that was across the plaza, down toward the Dodge house. Come on, Chester. Somebody sure is stirring up smoke. Yeah, that's across the street. Edge of the railroad yards, I think. you, Marshal? Yeah. What happened, Mr. Hunter? Somebody tried to kill me. I started into the hotel and they fired from the dock here. I fired back, but he got away. You, uh, get a good look at him? Oh, no, I just saw the flashes. Now, this is an easy town to get killed in, Mr. Hunter. So it seems. About that doctor, Marshal, you didn't bring him around. Well, uh, he's out on call. I think I want to meet him more than ever now. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, there's a world of wonderful entertainment awaiting you every weekday in the daytime with CBS Radio's roster of wonderful dramatic serials. 
This Monday, listen in. And now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. What time is it, Chester? Uh, 2.15 a.m., Mr. Dillon. Yeah. I sure hope we don't have to spend the whole night waiting here. I don't see how Doc puts up with the smell of all this medicine. He's used to it, I guess. Yeah. I suppose a man can get used to anything except dying. You think it could have been him that fired those shots, Mr. Dillon? Chester. Hmm? There's somebody coming. Come on in, Bunko. The doc's not here, but he'll probably be... Well, what happened to your arm? I... I got thrown into a barbed wire fence. Here, let's have a look at it, huh? No, 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 no. It's, it's all right. It's a gunshot wound. All right, hold it, both of you. Well, is that the same gun you tried to kill Hunter with, Bunko? Stay where you are, Marshal. Yeah. Around 30 years old, dark hair, mustache... Medium build, excellent horseman, re- confirmed gambler. Wanted from her. John Allison. Uh, alias Bunko Benson. Am I right, Bunko? He's not taking me back there. You stay where you are, Dylan. Now, don't be a fool, Bunko. Put away the gun. Stay back. I'm... I'm warning you. Bunko, look! All right, Chester, let's get him over to the jail. Mm, Just hold still now, Bunker. Just one more second. I'll have hold that bullet now, and then... We'll just... Ah! Ah, there. Ah, Add that one to your collection, Matt. Well, I'll make Hunter a present of it. It wasn't bad shooting to be firing in the dark at a gun flash. He'll never get me back to Virginia. Now, hold still, Bunko. Don't expect a man to tie a bandage with your arm waving around like a mare's tail in fly time. See, how'd you know he'd come to my office, Matt? Uh, I didn't, Doc. We were waiting for you. Oh, I see. There we are. No, 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 no. That ought to stop the bleeding. And don't loosen it up, Eddie. Don't. <laughs> and you'll live to hang yet. Don't worry about my hanging, Doc. I'll outlive you. Well, in view of the circumstances, uh, I'd say the odds are about even. Well, Matt, shall we adjourn to the front office? Yeah, come on, Doc. Uh, lock the cell, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. Well, I turned in at 10 o'clock tonight. I've got one hour of sleep. They called me over to Mrs. Behan's. She thought her baby was on the way. False alarm, of course. Usually is the first time. And I got back and I came straight over here. Uh, Doc, you were wearing a gun earlier today. What'd you do with it? Oh, I put it back in the drawer where it belonged. I realized I was acting like a fool. Uh, was that where you were waiting in my office? Somebody tried to kill Hunter, and, and you thought... Uh, Look, Doc, I, I've i tried to think of some way out of this. Uh, a way out for both of us. I got one man under arrest back there now, and I, I can't rightly set myself up as a judge and free the other man. I'd even hoped you'd cut and run for it. You, you'd get away if you did, you know. Hunter doesn't know the country. I've been running for 17 years, Matt, and... And it's still caught up with me. I'm too old to run any farther. What are you going to do? I'm a lawman, Doc, right or wrong. Well, then, uh, 
gets him under arrest. Huh? No, I, I, I didn't say that. I, I just said that... There's Doc Adams here. There's a... Oh, oh, there you are, Doc. Yes, yes, what's the trouble? A fellow over in the railroad yards asleep on the track. He was drunk, I guess. They were switching cars. You better come, Doc. He's awful bad. Oh, I... Good, Chester. You ready, Doc? You ready as I'll ever be. All right, let's go. Then. Uh, he said near the loading pens down this way, I guess. Yes, sir. It looks like some lights over there. People around. Yeah. Marshal, is that you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, Hunter. Uh, I thought you went to bed hours ago. I'm a light sleeper, Mr. Dillon. I heard there's an accident over in the yards. Thought it might give me a chance to meet your local doctor. Well, I, uh... I guess you can meet him right now if you want to. Doc, this is Ed Hunter, Doc Adams. How do you do, sir? Mr. Hunter? I, uh, I got one of your prisoners locked up, Mr. Hunter, John Allison. Known here as Bunko Benson. Good. I just found out he's the man who tried to kill you tonight. He caught one oh? of your bullets in his arm. Well, I see. Why, then it's one down and one to go. Just Calvin Moore... Dr. Calvin Moore. Uh, this is no time to stand around making Chen music. I'm sorry, well, that's Hunter. That's quite all right, Marshal. I'll go with you. Uh, will you pardon us, please? Uh, all right, will you move back and let us through here, please? Here, here, Doc, this way. Yeah, I'm right with you, Matt. Uh, please stand back now, will you? Give Doc a chance to yes, work. Yes, uh, please, if you please, just stand back. Uh, oh, oh, bad is right. Uh, well, we'll do what we can. Come on. That man who's hurt, Marshal, who is he? Oh, just a drifter. Been around Dodge a couple of years. Calls himself Texas Joe. No friends or family. Nobody knows where he came from. It's the usual story. Oh, easy now, Tex. We'll have you fixed up here in just a couple of shakes. Is... Is that you, Doc? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I told him, get you, be all right if you got here. Why, sure, it'll be all right. You just lie still now. And... Yeah. <laughs> Certainly has to work under primitive conditions. Doc? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chester, will you get those lanterns going and give Doc some more light? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's the only real doctor this side of Abilene. Hey, Mr. Dillon. Is there anything I can do to help? I guess not, Miss Kelly. Thanks, anyway. Poor old Tex. Why, he stopped in the restaurant not more than four hours ago. I fixed him a meal. Uh, you never know. Well, Doc can pull him through if anybody can. Sure he can. Uh, put one of those lanterns on the other side there, Chester. Yes, you Doc. seem to have a lot of faith in this Dr. Adams. They've got reason to, Mr. Hunter. Uh, Matt, uh, could you give me a hand here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, Doc. Uh, lift his head up just a little bit there, man. Yeah, all right. right. <laughs> Not much of a chance. All I can do is make him comfortable. Marshal Dillon. No, don't try to talk, Taxi. You're going to be all right. You, you've been decent to me, Marshal. Just a bum, but you treated me square. You and Doc, only friends I got. Sure, Tex. I, I got one more favor to ask. Could someone... Could someone read me some scripture? Well, Tex, I... I just don't recall any Marshall, of that. I, oh, no. I know some. Uh, Mrs. Kelly, I, I doubt if you can I, hear. I can hear. Please. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He restoreth my soul. Uh, Mrs. Kelly. He... Uh, I think that's enough. Poor soul. Poor soul. Well, <clears throat> you can't win them all, I guess. No, you can't win them all, Doctor. Well, I... Doctor, as the only physician here, I suppose you also function as coroner. That's right. Yes. 
This man will be buried under the name of Texas Joe. Hey, don't you worry about that. <clears throat> Boot Hill is full of men buried under nicknames. In this country, we... Doc! Doc, I just came from... Oh. What, Kitty? Well, uh, Doc, I, I've been sitting up with Mrs. B, and you left too soon. She needs you over there right away. Well, then it wasn't a false alarm. No. All right, Kitty, I'll be there just as quick as I can, but... Well, well, as soon as I... Uh, Kitty, you go on back over and do what you can for her, huh? Uh, Doc will be along. Well, all right, Matt, but you better hurry. Well, Mr. Hunter, I, uh... Uh, gentlemen, this seems to have been my lucky night. Both my fugitives located within an hour of each other. I guess there's nothing I one can do One of them safely to... in jail and one of them dead. What? Now, didn't you notice the resemblance, Marshal? That Texas Joe there, he's obviously the man in the photograph. I saw it immediately. Well, Mr. I Hunter, hope you'll I... take all the necessary steps to see that he's buried under his real name, Calvin Moore. His death, of course, closes the case, and I'll be leaving for Virginia with my other prisoner tomorrow. Well, Mr. Hunter, I... I just don't know what to say. Well, I... Now, I'd say it's no time to stand around making chin music, Dr. Adams. You have a patient waiting, and this town seems to depend on you. Well, of course, but... Hey, you got I... work to do, Doc. And, uh, Doc, make sure it's a boy. Huh? Well, I'll, uh... <laughs> um, I'll do my darndest, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Doc. Good night, Doc. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, Paul Dubov, and Vivi Janis. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas, through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow evening, listen for Lionel Barrymore, your host on CBS Radio's Sunday Night Playhouse. There will be another specially selected historical drama or a classic from literature with a cast of stars perfectly suited for the roles in the story. Every Sunday evening, hear Lionel Barrymore on your Sunday Night Playhouse over most of these same CBS radio stations. Truly an outstanding dramatic experience here at the Star's Address. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of escape, Listen every Sunday night to the CBS Radio Network.
Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. p.m. We got in right on time, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the railroad's getting better every month, Chester. Looks like they're going to civilize this prairie yet. Well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, let's go. Well, Abilene sure don't change much. Looks about like it did the last time I was here. Now yeah, we're getting most of the cattle at Dodge now. Boom's leveled off here. It's still a rough town, though, I suppose. You think he'll put up a fight? I don't know, Chester. He's pretty mean from all reports. He may. We'll try to avoid it, though. Of course, we're only guessing anyway. He, he might not even be here. Well, he always heads for Abilene when he gets in trouble. It's his hometown. He'll be here. Mm. And one good thing, it's Bill Hickok's town, too. At least we'll have the local sheriff on our side for once. Yeah. I suppose that's some help. Some help? <laughs> I'd rather have Wild Bill along than anybody I know. I suppose. Chester, what's the matter with you? You're acting like a man at his own funeral. Well, Mr. Dillon, I've had an uneasy feeling ever since we left Dodge. A kind of a hunch, you might say. Ah, oh, it's nonsense. They're going to pick up a killer and take him back for trial. That's all. Maybe. And maybe not. Look, Chester, any man who lives by a gun knows down inside that he's going to die by one someday. But if he's got any sense, he keeps from thinking about it. Of course, he can't help getting a hunch now and then. I had plenty of them myself. Mostly wrong. Come on, Chester, let's walk down to the last chance and I'll buy you a drink. As a matter of fact, I'll buy us both a drink. Quite a crowd in here for this time of day. Yeah. I've been looking around for Wild Bill, but I don't see him. Suppose the Daggett kid might be in here, Mr. Dillon? Well, he spent most of his time hanging around the saloons while he was in Dodge. Here you are, boys. Drink up. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, bartender, do you happen to know a kid around town by the name of... Uh... Who, mister? What? Oh, oh, never mind, never mind. Well, he's here, Chester. Hmm? Down there at the end of the bar. Yeah, that's him all right. Well, sir, Mr. Dillon? He's what we're here for. We gonna wait for Mr. Hickok? No. Come up on his left side, Chester, and watch his gun hand. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'm telling you, it was the funny sight you ever seen. Yeah. Bullet knocked that scrawny hound dog over end over end. <laughs> First shot of fired. Caught him right in the back of the... Yeah. You're Jack Daggett, aren't you? That's right, mister. 
What about it? My name's Dillon, U.S. Marshal from Dodge. You're under arrest. You're kind of out of your territory, aren't you? Marshal's territory's anywhere. I'll take that gun of yours now. You will, huh? All right. Drop it. Drop the gun. Let go of my wrist. The gun. Drop nothing. You heard the marshal. Oh. Uh, that was easy, Mr. Dillon. A lot easier than what I thought it'd be. All right, Chester, put the cuffs on it. Yes. Seems to me your partner acted a little high-handed there, Marshal. It does, huh? Now, he had no call to slug that boy in the head that way. Would you rather I'd have put a bullet in his belly? Chester saved his life, that's all. He was drawing on me. Well, now, if you'd come around and seen me before you started anything, you wouldn't have had this trouble. My name is Rourke. I'm the town constable here. I see. Young Jack here told me all about that shooting out in Dodge. Said they ganged up on him in a poker game, tried to cheat him. Forced him to shoot his way out. That's a good story. It's too bad it didn't happen that way. All right, Chester, let's get him on his feet and go find the sheriff. I, uh, reckon you won't be finding him, Marshal. Why not? Hickok's up at Topeka. Won't be back for a week or ten days. Meantime, I'm the law in Abilene. And I got a favor to ask from you. I'd like to use one of your jail cells until 9 o'clock. That's when the next train leaves for Dodge. Mm, well, I'm sorry, Marshal. I got no authority to do anything like that. What difference does that make? If Wild Bill were here, he'd let me do it. But Wild Bill ain't here. I see. A lot of us folks here like to run our own town. We don't like outsiders coming in and taking over. It's four hours till that train leaves, Marshal. I think you're going to find four hours in a long time. Meaning? This uh, young fellow you arrested has got a couple of older brothers. The Daggett boys. You probably never heard of them, but you're going to. They're not going to like this. I don't care much what they like. Maybe they'll teach you to care when they hear about this. And they'll hear. Like I said, four hours is a long time. Look, I want you to get this straight. I came here to arrest the killer and take him back to Dodge to stand trial. I got him under arrest now, and I'm going to take him back. Maybe. All right, Chester, let's get him out of here. Get hold of his other arm there. Lift him up. Yes, sir. Take him out if you want. Mr. Dillon? What is it, Chester? Maybe it was too easy. Yes, gentlemen. What can I do for you? We'd like to get a room, please. Well, I have a very nice one right at the head of the stairs. If you'd care to look at that it... That won't be necessary. We'll only need it for about four hours until the train leaves for Dodge. Mm-hmm. Well, if you'll just sign the register here. Thank you. My, your friend seems to have suffered quite an injury. Yes, sir. He bumped his head. Oh, really? Well, it's certainly a bad cut just to have had... Boy, that... That's one of the Daggett boys. Young Jack Daggett. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I got him under arrest for murder. Now, where's the room? You arrested Jack Daggett? Right here in Abilene? Yeah. Did you say the room was up... And, and you're planning to keep him here at my hotel for the next four hours? Well, I can't stand out there on the street with him. Oh, Marshal. Marshal, do you know what's going to happen when the Daggett boys hear about this? No, but I understand they may not like it very much. May not like it. I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot stay here. I will not let my hotel be made the scene of a bloody massacre. Now, just a minute, mister. You've yeah, I, rented me a room. I've I, signed the register, and I've got the key. I, I, and I'm going to use that I... room until 9 o'clock, whether you like it or not. It's the second door at the top of the stairs. Thank you. Come on, Daggett. Move. 
You heard him, son. Come on. Keep your hands off. There's just one thing, sir. Yeah. It's, it's not a question of your honesty, you understand, but in view of the circumstances, I wonder if you'd mind uh, paying in advance. <laughs> What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 6.23, Mr. Dillon. Mm, I thought it was later than that. Yes, sir, I know. He goes pretty slow when you're waiting for something. Like this. I swear I wished it was 9 o'clock. I, I wished we were leaving on that train right now. You're not leaving on no train. Not alive. You got a one-track mind, Daggett. So have my brothers, Dylan. What they think about all the time is hands off the Daggetts. That goes for you or anybody else. Reckon we ought to stuff a pillow in his mouth, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> Might not be a bad idea. You won't think it's funny when they come around. But maybe they won't come around. Maybe they decided... Cover the door from the other side, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah, who is it? It's me, sir. The clerk. What do you want? It's the Daggett boys. They're across the street at the last chance right now. And you're hoping I'll go over there instead of waiting for them to come here, huh? Well, I... I... All right. I'd rather jump them than have it the other way around. Chester, I guess we'll go over and have a talk with them. What about him? Well, he's cuffed hand and foot to a pretty solid iron bed. I don't think he's going anywhere. I'll bet on it. You ready, Chester? I'm ready whenever you are, Mr. Dillon. All right, let's go. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night and most of these same stations, be sure to be with us when Lux Radio Theater raises the curtain on its full hour adaptation of the exciting screenplay Phone Call from a Stranger. Shelley Winters and Gary Merrill recreate their original screen roles in this dramatic thriller about the experiences of a lone survivor of an airplane crash in bringing the tragic news to families of the victims. Remember, it's on Lux Radio Theater this Monday night on CBS Radio. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. That must be them, Mr. Dillon. Across the room there. Yeah, I guess so. They look a lot like Jack. And they look mad. And there's quite a crowd around them. Well, Chester, the only way to get it over is to get it started. Yes, sir. Uh, how will we do it, Mr. Dillon? I haven't got a plan, Chester. Face them down, that's all. Yes, sir. You're the Daggett brothers? What if we are? This is him, Jim. This is a fellow. Shut up, Rourke. You've been glad enough to stay out of this so far. Stay out of it now. My name's Dillon, United States Marshal from Dodge City. I got your brother Jack under arrest for murder. You probably heard about it. Yeah, rumors got around. I'm taking him out of here on the 9 o'clock train. He's going back to Dodge to stand trial. My guess is he's going to hang. Yeah. Now, the point is, what are you going to do about it? Why didn't you wait? 
we'll look you up. <laughs> you didn't answer my question. Still two hours and a half till nine o'clock. I reckon we've got plenty of time yet. We'll wait. Why wait? What's the matter with now? Would rather wait. Maybe you're trying to pick up some helpers among this bunch of hangers-on, huh? Well, look at them. Each one to trying to sneak behind the man next to him. If you're counting on any help there, you better forget it. You're pushing your luck, Dylan. I don't think so. You boys are full of talk, and that's all. You never even intended to start anything. You're a dirty liar. We're going to do Hold plenty. It. Now, don't you move, either one of you. You're covering my back, Chester? Yes, sir. All right. I'll take that gun. Thank you. Yours, too. Sure. It's your play, Dylan. Where it stands now. Thank you. Here, Chester. Kick those back under the tables. Yes, sir. All right, folks, just leave them lay, please. Don't nobody touch them. Here, Chester. Now hold on to my gun. All right, Mr. Dillon. Now just keep them off my back. Yes, sir. You. Come here. Sure. You called me a liar, didn't you? Yeah. Boy, you cheap chin horn. You are killing me. I thought you daggers were tough. Watch this, watch this. All right, you. You're next. Oh, wait, Marshal. I'll get to you later. You're a no good coward, Daggett. All right, Chester, I'll take my gun back now. Here you are, sir. Thank you. All right, boys, the show's over. Unless, of course, one of you'd like to take up where the Daggett's left off. Any one of you still figuring on helping them try to take my prisoner away from me? No? I didn't think so. You're all fine, upright citizens now, huh? A pride and joy to Constable Rourke here. That's enough, Dylan. I thought I told you boys the show was over. All right, get out. Go on, get out, all of you. Move! Marshal, I'd say you overreached yourself there. Eh? Step past the limits of your authority. How I enforce the law is my own business. I do things my own way. The uh, way it'll get you killed someday. Maybe. I have to live in this town, Dylan. You don't know these Daggett brothers. If you cross them, you're through. I've seen it happen. Come on, Chester, let's go. All right, Mr. Dillon. What time is it, Chester? It's... It's 7.45, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, the time's dragging. Yes, sir. It's still an hour and 15 minutes till that train leaves. What difference does it make? You're not going to be on it. Neither one of you are. The way I'm figuring, Jack, we'll all three be on it. You wait and see. You'll never get to that train. My brothers will take care of you. They don't seem to be in any hurry about it. You wait. I sure do wish I hadn't had such an uneasy hunch about this trip. <laughs> Forget it, Chester. They'll stop you. You just wait. <laughs> You 
It's only 8.15. Mr. Dillon seems to be going slower all the time. Yeah, it's up, though. It won't be much longer now. 45 minutes. If the train's on time. And if we're lucky enough to get on it. Chester, you're wearing yourself out. Why don't you sit down and relax, huh? I just can't seem to set my mind to it, Mr. Dillon. No Daggett will ever leave this town wearing handcuffs as long as the other two are alive. Well, I'd think that's up to them, Jack. Sure. And they'll take care of it, too. I, I swear and declare, Mr. Dillon, I almost wish they would try something and get it over with. <laughs> the waiting's always the worst part, Chester. You find out what the worst part is. I could slug him, Mr. Dillon. No, let him talk. Let him talk, Chester. He's only got a few more weeks to do it in. <laughs> They'll never hang me. I'll never even stand trial. You wait and see. Chester? It's half past eight exactly, Mr. Dillon. All right. Let's get started. A little early, isn't it? Won't take that long to walk from here to the station. It might if we have trouble. Yes, sir, I guess it might. You'll have trouble. Don't you worry about that. Jack, why don't you get on a new subject? How are we going to take him, Mr. Dillon? Just drag him? If he wants it that way. Otherwise, he'll walk handcuffed to my left wrist. Keep him covered, Chester. I'll unlock these cuffs and get him loose from the bed. Yes, sir. Dylan, if you're smart, you leave me here and run while you still got the chance. Well, I've never been smart enough to run yet. Stick out your right wrist. All right. On your feet. Come on. You can put your gun away, Chester. Starting now, he's only going where I go. Now, come on, Jack. We got a train to catch. Thank heaven, gentlemen, you're leaving. Yeah, we're leaving. And I want to thank you for your wonderful hospitality. I'll be glad to recommend your hotel to anybody who plans to stop over in Abilene. Oh... I uh, hardly know what to say, Marshal. You simply don't understand. You don't know these Daggett brothers. Uh, no, no, no offense personally, Jack. I have to live in this town, and I... Come on, Jack. Uh, I... Uh... Now, you boys must run quite a bluff. You got everybody in town jumping sideways. You'd be smart if you did, Dylan. Uh, good luck, gentlemen. Uh, best of luck to... Uh... To all of you. <laughs> all of us. Well, that's hedging his bet. Up there, Mr. Dillon. Not a soul on the street. Quiet as a graveyard. Yeah. And they're going to make a play, Chester, somewhere between here and the depot. We can count on that. Yes, sir. I kind of figured they would. Especially after getting beat up over there at the saloon. Well, they would have anyway. And jumping them like that did one good thing. It scared the pack off. At least we only have to worry about the Daggetts, not a mob. You'll think it's a mob shut by up. the time... Now, from here on, you keep your mouth shut. If you don't so help me, I'll slug you and drag you to the depot. All right, now, let's go. Now, sir, not a soul. I never thought I'd see the main street of Abilene deserted at this time of night. It's not deserted, Chester. They're inside behind the shutters. But at least they're staying out of it. I wonder if coyotes are as lonesome as they sound, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> they couldn't be, Chester. Watch that left side up ahead of us, sir. It's pretty dark along there. Yes, sir. They might jump us from behind. I don't think so. Too many people watching. They gotta keep up their reputation. I hope you're right. Chester, mm -hmm. there at the corner of the bank, somebody's moved. Across the street, too. 
In the shadow. Take the one in the shadow, Chester. Yes, sir. There's one down, Chester. The other one's still there in the shadows. Get him if you can. Jack, here's ruining my aim. I'll ruin more. All right! Yeah. Good for you, Mr. Dillon. You ought to have slugged him sooner. I didn't slug him, Chester. He caught a bullet that was meant for me. Well, shot by one of his own brothers. Here, let me unlock those handcuffs, Mr. Dillon. No, no time. Here, I'll, I'll get him up on my shoulder and... All right, let's move in and keep firing. Yes, sir. Hey! Hold it, Chester. Well, I guess we got the other one. Here, let me get him off my shoulder. Get these handcuffs off. Well, there's our prisoner, Jack Daggett. Wanted for murder, killed by his own brother. Let's take a look at the others. Three men dead. Look down the street there, Mr. Dillon. They're all starting to crawl out of their holes. Sure. They're all on our side now. Oh, come on, Chester. The train's coming. We've got to get on it and get out of here. Yes, sir. Don't let Rourke clean up this mess. He ought to be good for something. <laughs> that sounds more lonesome than the coyotes. It was a man of creeps. Yes, sir, it sure does. Well, you were wrong about that hunch of yours, Chester. It wasn't us. Not this time. Smoke under the direction of Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Barney Phillips, with John Daner, Tom Tully, Larry Dobkin, and Jim Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tomorrow night, Lionel Barrymore and your Hallmark Playhouse invite you to enjoy another Hollywood cast, bringing you another drama in the tradition of this fine program. Every week, your Hallmark Playhouse features Lionel Barrymore as host, Frequently, Mr. Barrymore stars as well. Historic dramas, stories about the human side of patriots, presidents, pioneers, and adaptations from literature. Enjoy them on Hallmark Playhouse over most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, for thrilling dramas of Escape, listen Sunday nights to the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the spell of gun smoke. Gun 
Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It was over a hundred miles back to Dodge, but I figured I could make it easy in a day and a half. I'd been in Hayes City as a government witness in a murder trial, and I was anxious to get back. So I rode out of Hayes one morning a couple of hours before light. The ground was clear as snow, but it was midwinter, and it was sharp cold. When the day came, there was no sun, only dark gray sky drilled by a high, cold, searching wind. The air was as thin as I could ever remember it being behind me in the north lay a great slab of blackness. When I saw that, I should have turned back, for the wind stood out of the north, too, and sooner or later it would drive that black slab right down on top of me. This was blizzard weather, the kind of weather that kills the land and everything on it. I don't know why I went on, maybe because of the wind. You know, a high wind will distemper a man, make him drunk-like. Anyway, I didn't turn back. And about noon, the sky began to turn white with snow, and I could smell a touch of moisture in the air. And finally it came, the sleet, shrilling in on the wind like small buckshot as the blizzard howled down the prairie. I couldn't look right or left without being stung blind, but as long as I kept the wind on my back, I knew I was headed south. Two hours of this, and I could feel my horse slowing down and weakening under me. My own body stiffened with the cold. Men died when they got caught in a thing like this. They died easy. Another hour passed, and my horse was carrying his head close to the ground. I figured he'd stumble soon, so I kicked my feet out of the stirrups and braced myself against the horn. By now, the wind had really gotten into me. And when I saw the blur of a ranch house up ahead, I thought maybe it was a trick. But a few minutes later, we rounded a corner of the place and stood at last in the lee of the storm. I slid down and got up to the door and pounded on it. And I waited. Then I pounded again. Then the door came open and the figure stood in the light. Who are you? Bring him in, Alvy. Any man out in that weather has been made harmless. Get inside. Out of the way, Alvy, you fool. All right, stranger, hands in the air. Hi. That's better. Unload him, Alvy. Nice gun, Hank. Real nice gun. Shut up. Now, take him down, stranger. You can come up to the stove now, but don't try nothing. I'll cut you in half with buckshot. He was a burly man with flushed cheeks and a wild red beard and a great shock of red hair. Even his hands and fingers bristled with it. He sat on a stool by the stove, a shotgun across his knees. And his eyes never left me. The other one, Alvy. Had a body of an underfed boy, but he was completely bald, and his skin was tight and dry. He looked like a naked skull, and his eyes, well, something had touched Alvy. You look half froze, stranger. You must have wanted something real bad to go out in weather like this. I never saw him around here before, Hack. He's a stranger, Alvy. He don't belong around here. Of course, we don't know anybody, but I, I, I've seen a few, and i never seen him before. Maybe he's seen you, Alvy, somewhere. Not me. He, he never saw me nowhere. How do you know that? Maybe he was just looking for some cows and got lost in a storm. You're just a kid, Alvy. always said you don't know much. Bell! Bell, get on out here. She was a pretty girl but with a dark, half-wild look that I'd never seen before in a woman. Her eyes jumped from man to man and then came to rest on me, 
fixed and curious. And then after a moment, she looked away and moved it into a chair across the room. Supper ready, Belle? It's awful cold out. You recognize him, Belle? You ever see him before? Nope. You're sure now. Maybe Hayes City. Maybe you saw him up there sometime. I don't know him. You sure? Yes. If you're lying to me, you know what I'll do to I you. I never saw him before. He come in here half froze, right right out of the blizzard. Must have been looking for some cows and got lost. Shut up, Albie. We don't know what he's doing here, Bill. Why shouldn't a man get out of the storm? Even in here. That's enough. All right, stranger, we never saw you before. We don't know who you are. And as soon as I think you're lying, I'm going to blow a big hole in you. What about my horse? I'd like to put him in the barn if you've got one. Alvy. Oh, now, Hack, I ain't going out there. I'd freeze. And the horse will freeze if you don't. It's his horse. We might need it. Go on, Alvy, before I get cross. All right, I'll go. I don't know why the horse is so important. Elvie's a good boy. He'll put your horse up. Thank you. Supper's about ready. Leave it. I want to talk to our friend here first. Maybe we won't have to feed him. Potatoes will get mealy. They better not, that's all. I'm right curious about you, mister. I've noticed that. I'll blow your guts all over the wall. You make fun of me. Don't get me mad, mister. I got the shotgun. The meat will be boiled to shreds if we don't eat soon. You just won't understand any other way, will you, Bell? What is it you want to know about me? <laughs> I can tell, mister, I can handle you easy now. What do you mean? All I got to do is wallop the girl and you'll talk. I don't have to do nothing to you. All right, if I take my jacket off, I've warmed up now. I mind. You might have a gun hit out in there. He can raise his hands. I'll unbutton it. Well, now, that's right smart of you, Bell. Oh, I'll hide it. No, leave it be. Bell, come over here, Bell. Drop the jacket, Bell. Now hold out your other hand. Now open it, Bell. Open your hand. That's real bad what you did, Bell. Real bad. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you outside for a spell out in the weather. After supper, after you've cleaned up supper, you can be thinking about it till then. United States Marshal. You're in bad company, Marshal. You shouldn't have come here. Oh? It looks to me like I sort of struck gold coming here. Now, why do you talk like that, Marshal? I still got the shot. Let me get that stove. Seems like it's getting colder and colder. You didn't see any sign of nobody outside, did you, Alvy? What? Who? Somebody might have come along to cover the marshal here, it's all. Marshal? What, what, what marshal? Me. I'm a marshal, Alvy. Shoot him, Hack. Shoot him. Shut up and answer me. Was there sign of another horse footprints, anything like that? Oh, I didn't see nothing. Maybe you didn't look. Would I have walked in here the way I did if I'd been after you people? Maybe your head got muddled with the cold. Where'd you ride from, Marshal? Hayes City. Left there this morning. <laughs> it was a fool thing to do with a blizzard coming up. Maybe. Or did you think you could get the jump on us easier in a storm? Was that it, Marshal? Yeah, you knew we'd be trying to keep cozy in here. I'm curious, Hack. What are you and Alvy on the run for? Don't you tell him, Hack. I don't trust him at all. <laughs> Alvy, it'd be mighty dull without you, boy. <laughs> don't laugh at me, Hack. Now stop it. I don't like laughing. You know that, Hack. And don't you do it no more. 
I got ways. Yeah, I ain't seen you in your ways. But don't try them on me, Alvie. Maybe I won't. Look, Alvie, now you don't understand. It's all right to tell the marshal about us. He ain't going nowhere. No? No, of course not. We'll kill him, Alvie. We'll kill him and bury him somewhere. Oh, sure. Now, now, why didn't I think of that? Because I do the thinking for us, Alvie. That's why. Now, uh, what was it you like to know, Marshal? Stop playing games, Hack. Me and Alvie are wanted for murder. Up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Seems a mite unfair, though. We didn't aim to kill nobody. It just happened that way. We was robbing the bank. Yeah, and a couple of the people there wouldn't do what we told them, so Alvy used his knife on one, but it just made the man holler. You could hear him all over town. And we had to shoot our way out after that. Must have killed three or four people. I know I killed two. Worst of it was, Marshal, all we wanted just then was some money. We didn't care about killing anybody. But you know how it is, Marshal, when you're robbing a bank and all... Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, I don't suppose you do it that. Anyway, we're wanted for murder, and we didn't even get any money. Nary a dollar. So we rode out here and lighted for a spell. I see. What about Bell? And whose place is this, anyway? It's my place, now that Pa's gone. You mean you were living here alone? No. They killed your Pa, is that it? Yes. How long ago? I don't know. Maybe a month. Yeah, it's been about a month, hasn't it, Alvy? Thirty-five days. There, you see? Alvy always knows just how long everything's been. Now, that's fine. Tell me what you do with him. Who? The old man. Oh, we, we buried him out back. We <laughs> couldn't afford a funeral. <laughs> Could we, Alvy? Hack, 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 we told him that... Now let's shoot him. No, no, I've been thinking it over. People in Hayes City know he started for Dodge, and when he don't show up, they might come looking for him. But you you said we'd bury him, Hack. That's what you said. Yeah, that's right, but we can't bury his horse, too. Not in this ground. It's froze solid. And if we turn the horse loose and they find it and can't find the marshal's body, then they'll suspect something. You're pretty smart, Hack. Too bad you don't know enough to stop killing people. Too bad for you, anyway. Well, what are we going to do, Hack? I'm getting hungry. That supper won't be fit to eat. Shut up! One more word out of you, Bella, and I'll whoop you good. Come on, Hack. I'm really hungry. No, no, listen to me, Alvy. Now, my idea is to knock the marshal on the head and throw him outside to freeze. Now, he'll keep real good that way. And when the storm breaks, we can carry him off 20 miles or so and dump him on the ground. Look like he got throwed and hit his head and froze. That's fine, Hack. That's just fine. Then we'll break his horse's leg, make it easier for them to find him. You just don't care about anything, do you, Hack? Just me. Sometimes, Alvy. Sure. But me and Hack are, are friends, ain't we, Hack? Of course, if it don't want snowing, we'll have to think of something else. Can't leave tracks for them to follow back there. Oh, Hack, ain't we gonna kill him now? Well, sure, sure we are, Alvy. I didn't mean that. Let me hit him, huh? You, you keep the gun on him, and I'll get up behind and hit him. There, there was a Brandon iron around here somewhere. I'll, I'll hit him with that. Hack, you sunk pretty far, but I'm sort of wondering just how far. What do you mean? I'm wondering if you're low enough to kill a man before he's been fed. Here, here it is, Hack. Here, see? I found it. Leave it be, Alvy. We're going to eat first. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... This Sunday night, Lionel Barrymore is your host and Joseph Cotton the star on Sunday Night Playhouse's gripping historic drama based on the life of Peter Marshall. Hear how a Scottish immigrant lad rose to the position of chaplain of the United States Senate. A story you'll agree is far more fascinating than fiction. Remember, it's tomorrow night when Lionel Barrymore introduces another Sunday Night Playhouse on most of these same CBS radio stations. 
Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. It was only five in the afternoon, but the blizzard had darkened the land, and its blackness showed in at the windows. Here and there along the walls of the ranch house, tricklets of snow blew in through the warped timber. In the kitchen, Hank sat directly behind me while I ate. Later changed places with Alvy and fed himself heartily, as though he had nothing at all on his mind. Hack was just a nerveless brute, born with no conscience at all. His intelligence was the instinct of an animal that snapped at or killed whatever got in its way of survival. Every living thing was his enemy. And Alvy? Well, there was no way to figure Alvy. Too much of him was missing. My only chance lay in the girl, Belle. Even though Hack had pretty well beaten all resistance out of her. Supper was over soon enough, but Hack seemed in no particular hurry to get on with his plans. I've eaten better food on the trail than that. Can't blame me for it. Get it cleaned up, Belle. You can talk your head off when you're outside alone, and you're going outside. I'll learn you to heal if I have to break your neck. Now, don't do that, Hack. Not till we're ready to pull out, anyway. Why? Well, I ain't gonna do the cooking. Well, I hope not. I've eaten your cooking. My sister was a good cook. Yeah, we should have brought her along, Alvy. No. no. I don't like her. Where are you from, anyway? Which, me or Alvy? Well, you to start with. Wyoming, place called Crowhart. I didn't stay there long, though. What about you, Alvy? Now, where were you born, Alvy? I never did know. Republican River. <laughs> that's not a place, you fool. Well, that's what they told me, Republican River. They always lived in a wagon, my ma and pa. They had a lot of kids, too. Of course, most of them died. I'm about the only one that made out any good at all. And you did fine, I'll be fine. <laughs> hey, give me the shotgun. Yeah. All right, Marshal, let's get back by the stove while Bell cleans this mess up. Shall we hit him and... Throw him out to freeze up now, Hack? Not yet. I want to punish Bell first. You know, someday you're going to get caught without that shotgun, Hack. Somebody's going to tear you apart. That's fair enough, Marshal. Give me a fair chance at you then, huh? Barehanded? No. No, oh, you're bigger than I am, Hack. Might be fun for you. I don't know nothing about fun. I ain't going to kill you because it's fun. Oh, come on, Hack. I want to go to bed. Bell. Bell, come out here. Get outside like I told you. And don't open that door so wide you'll blow the lamp out. Bell had walked through the room and out the door without a glance at any of us. I figured she'd go down to the barn where she'd be all right for a little while anyway. But I knew I'd have to make a move soon. I sure wasn't going to sit there like a fall hog and let Alvy knock me in the head whenever he got ready. But it didn't take much more sense to try to jump Hack in that shotgun and let him blow me all over the place. It was a beggar's choice, and the more I thought about it, the matter I got. Uh, Hack, I'm sleepy. I'm going to hit him and go to bed. You can do what you want after, but I ain't staying up all night. Alvy's got his mind made up, Marshal, I can tell. Just what do you call his mind, Hack? I got ways to fix you, Marshal. Nah, never mind, Alvy. Wrap something around that iron, otherwise it won't look like he hit his head on a rock. What difference it makes? Do what I say, Alvy. All right, Hack. Here, I'll use this curtain. Now, keep your eyes on me, Marshal. 
Alvy moved around behind me and was getting a good grip on his brand and iron. I leaned slightly forward in the chair and was tensed and waiting for the split second when my instinct had told me to jump. And then suddenly the door was flying wide open and the wind roared in, almost lifting the room as it came. The lamp flared and then went out as I plunged sideways from the chair. Ah! Did you hit him, Alvy? Did you hit him? Ah, you bloody fool. Don't you try nothing, Marshal. I got some more shells right here. Don't you move now. I crawled across the room and was off the door before Hack could reload. In the snow outside, I stood up and turned to find Belle waiting by the side of the door, a pitchfork in her hand. I couldn't see her face very well in the dark, but I could tell she was shaken with cold. I reached out and took the fork from her and then flattened myself against the wall and waited. I was afraid it was you he shot. That was a smart trick, Belle, throwing the door open that way. He shot Alvy, didn't he? Yeah. Good. I think he's found out I'm not in there. What are you going to do? Wait. Marshal. Marshal. I'm going to kill you and the girl both now. I waited, praying he'd come through the door before my hands got too cold to hold the pitchfork. And finally, the barrel of the shotgun appeared waist high and began to poke its way around in our direction. It was stupid of him, but the man behind the gun often gets a false sense of power. I let him shove it out three or four inches, and then I... Slam down on me. Then I jumped into the room. Hack tried to club me with a gun, but he missed. And I got in under him with a fork and lifted him off his feet. And he struggled for a moment like a spirit fish and then went limp. And I let him fall. One of the prongs had reached his heart. Did you... Get him, Marshal. Is he dead? Yeah. I light the lamp. I can't do it, Marshal. My fingers are too stiff. Here, I'll I'll do it. There. Quite a mess in here. Why don't you wait in the kitchen, Belle? I'm all right, Marshal. But I can't help you much till I get warmed up some. Well, then you'll stay by the stove, huh? I'll lug these people outside. Thank you, Marshal. Marshal? Marshal Dillon? What? Oh. Morning, Belle. Come on out in the kitchen, Marshal. It's warm there, and I got some hot coffee waiting. Uh, well, that sounds good. Uh, I say, it looks like the storm's lifted. It has. The wind's gone, but it's mighty cold out. Well, I don't mind the cold. It's that wind that breaks a man down. There. Get some of that in you. Uh. Mm. Oh, you make mighty good coffee, Belle. <laughs> Tell me something, Marshal. Hmm? Tell me the truth now. Oh, uh, sure, Belle. What is it? Are you married? I'd make a... Poor husband, Belle, for any woman. Why? Well, in my profession, it's... It's too chancy. Thank you, Marshal. Thanks for putting it that way. Now, Belle, I, I didn't mean... Forget to... it. I'm leaving this place, Marshal. What? As soon as you go, I've packed what I need and I'm clearing off. Where will you go? I got three horses. I'll ride up to Hayes City and sell them. Then what? I'll buy some pretty clothes. And I'll find a place. Won't be hard. 
After this? I, uh... I wish I could help you, Belle. You have. Oh, but I mean... I can uh, take care of myself, Marshal. I just want to get away from here, that's all. Sure. Uh, I'll stop at the nearest ranch and tell the men to come over here and take care of Hack and Alvy as soon as it warms up. Whatever you like, Marshal. Well, <laughs> goodbye, Belle. Goodbye, Marshal. Look me up in Hayes City next time you're there. Sure. Sure I will. But, uh... Belle, don't let all this make you bitter. There are a lot of good men in the world. So they say. So long, Marshal. I, uh... So long, Belle. A few minutes later, I'd saddled up and was on the trail to Dodge. The sky was low and a slate gray all over, but there was no wind. The blizzard had gone, leaving the land still and white and bitter cold. There wasn't a sign of life anywhere. It was like riding through a vast tomb. I found myself feeling like a trespasser. As though something had gone wrong. And I wasn't supposed to be there at all. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner as Hack, Harry Bartell as Alvy, and Vivi Janis as Bell. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Starts this Monday, a new run for Road of Life, returning to CBS Radio to join the rest of your daytime listening favorites at the Star's Address. Road of Life, telling the day-to-day -day story of surgeon scientist Dr. Jim Brent. We'll keep your interest at a high point every Monday through Friday on most of these same stations. Remember, starting this coming Monday, Road of Life in its 16th year will be heard again on CBS Radio. Roy Rowan speaking. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. 
starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Sure made himself scarce in a hurry, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it looks that way. The plaza seems pretty quiet. Maybe he got the wind up and rode right on out of town. You're giving him credit for too much sense, Chester. Yes, sir. The only time that Mallard bunch stops is when somebody stops them. Hey, come on, let's take a look in the Texas tree. All right. Something wrong? Kitty, I'm looking for Billy Mallard. Ah. Has he been around? Take a look at the mirror back of the bar. He's shot up half the town already and passed the word out that he's going to shoot up the rest of it before midnight. When was he here? Uh, half an hour ago, Matt. Drunk, mean. I can't stand him or his father. Maybe they do own half of Texas, but I hate him. Well, they're Texans, Miss Kitty, and that means they've always got to be... Chester. Stand- I told the Mullers when they brought their cattle up here last year that they'd have to act civilized. Come on, Chester. Sounded like it's up at the west end of the plaza. Yeah. It's probably the Occidental. Oh, just a second, Marshal. What? Huh? Oh, what is it, Mr. Colby? About those pistol shots, Marshal. Now, I reckon that's young Billy Meller kicking up his heel. Well, in about five minutes, he's going to be kicking him up in jail. No, 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 no. Let's not be hasty, Marshal Dillon. We have to think of the best interest of Dodge City in a situation like this. What? Those Mallers are mighty important people, you know. Own one of the biggest ranches in Texas. Always throw a lot of money around when they come up here with a herd. Well, as far as I'm concerned, he gets the same treatment as any other drunken cowboy. I'm sorry, Mr. Tony. Now, wait a minute. All you're going to do is antagonize them. They'll turn their drives east from now on. They'll ship their stock out of Hayes City or Abilene. And you can't arrest Billy anyways. He's got that gunman, Tom Wayne, and 30, 40 Maller Ranch riders back of him. Look, I'll argue with you later. I got a job to do. Dylan, you can't do that. Chester, let's go pick him up. That's him, all right, Mr. Dillon. Standing there in the light. Yeah. I see him. Must be a dozen or more of his riders with him. Chester, you keep Tom Wayne covered. The rest of them will wait for him to make the first move. I'll take Billy. Yes, sir. Mallard! Well, now, what do we got here? Local marshal, huh? Put the gun away, Muller. Why don't you try to put it away for me, Marshal? All right. Mr. Wayne, you'll keep your hands still and in plain sight. I said put the gun away, Billy. You're talking mighty big, Marshal. For a man with empty hands. That ten star of yours makes a good target. I got me a whole collection of stars like that. That's far enough. You better hold it right where you are. I gave you two warnings, Billy. That's one more than I usually give a man. Now, you hand over that gun. I told you to take it if you think you can. Let's go. Stop! 
You'll bend that gun barrel someday, Marshal. Laying it over a man's head that way. Don't worry about it, Wayne. As long as it's not your head. I'm not worried. I would be, though, if I was wearing that star of yours. Why? Old King Malley, he don't like badge toters much. Especially when they buffalo the boy here. And he better leave the boy at home when he brings a herd north. Does he get away with this kind of behavior down there? He does. Well, here it's different. You can see for yourself. Maybe it ain't over yet, either. You weren't figuring on drawing a hand, were you, Wayne? It's nothing to me, Marshal. Not unless I get orders from King. Well, he knows where he can find me. Yeah, I reckon. All right. The rest of you men. You can stay up all night, spend your money, do as you please. With one exception. If any one of you pulls a gun inside the city limits of Dodge, you'll get the same treatment as young Mallor here. Is that clear? Come on, John. Let's go. All right, Chester, let's drag him over to the jail. There you are, Mr. Dillon. All right, in you go, Billy. Sure he is out cold. Well, it's better than having a bullet in the stomach. That's what he was asking for. He certainly was. I declare, Mr. Dillon, if you don't stop taking chances when a man's already got a gun in his hand... Chester, you can't shoot every cowboy who has a snort or two and starts to take it out from the town. I know, sir, but... Here, hand me that bucket of water there in the corridor, will you? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, Billy... Yeah, that ought to bring him around. All right, Chester, lock up the cell. Just a minute there, Marshal. Don't lock that cell. Lock it up, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just told you to stop that matter. Didn't you hear me? I can probably hear you clear back in Texas. Now, what's on your mind? I'll tell you what's on my mind. I want my boy out of that cell. And I want him out in a hurry. Come around in the morning when the court opens. He's under arrest. Arrest? You? I can buy you in this 30-cent town of yours and never know the difference. Maybe. But we'd know it. Now, you shut up and get out of here. I've argued about this long enough. Either you'll open that cell or hand over the key. I'm sorry. Uh, you there. Come on, hand them over. Here now, Mr. Mallard. What's Dang, you've gone far you? enough. You think some tin horn is going in? To... Oh. I said leave him alone. Let, let go of me, Dylan. Chester, unlock the cell. Yes, sir. I'm warning you, Marshal, for the last time. If you don't get your hands off me. Sure, King. Here you go. Now lock it up, Chester. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll break you, Dylan. I'll break you and run you out of the country. Sure. Sure, I know. But you'll have to wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> Kind of quiet around town, Mr. Dillon, with them mallards locked up. Well, you and Chester look thirsty, man. I brought you a pitcher of beer. On the house. Well, it's not a bad idea, Kitty. Well, thank you. I have heard about the mallards. They ought to be locked up in the same cell. They're two of a kind. Well, Kitty, it's... I don't know. Kid always has had his way paid for him by the old man's money. I don't know who's more to blame. Excuse me, Kitty. Uh Uh-huh. But uh, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do here. Uh, Well, you'll learn, honey. Oh, Matt, I don't think you've met Nora Beale. Huh? Matt Dillon, Nora. And Chester Proudfoot. Proud to know you. How do you do, ma'am? 
Well, now, honey, all you got to do right now is just stand around and look beautiful. I'll be along in a second and show you the rope. Oh, well, thank you, Kitty. I'm very pleased to have met both of you. Thank you. Likewise, ma'am. Oh, where'd she come from? She's new in Dodge, isn't she? Oh, yeah. She's real sweet, Matt. She's a singer from Chicago or somewhere. She got stranded here a couple of days ago. She only plans to work a week. Excuse and make me, Miss Kitty. Mr. Dillon, look. There's King Mallard. What? Over at the bar there, Mr. Kelby. Well, what's he doing out of jail, Matt? My gracious, you arrest a man and throw him in jail, and an hour and a half later he's out loose again. It's aggravating. But I'm sure he didn't mean any harm by it, Mr. Miller. It's just that sometimes he's got... Well, now. Now, Marshal, let's keep our temper. Shut up. King, how did you get out of jail? When I've got anything to say to you, Dylan, I'll look you up. Now, now, Marshal, it's all perfectly legal. Mayor came down to his office, he fixed bail, and he released Mr. Maller and his son. They're both out, huh? Who went bail for this, Covey? Now, it's all in the best interest of the town, Marshal. Just like I've been telling Mr. Maller here. It was just a misunderstanding, and all of us hope he won't hold it against it. Covey, I ought to run you in for obstructing justice. <laughs> Somebody fired from the street, Mr. Dillon. I'll go out there. What? What? What is it, Kitty? No, Bill got hit, man. She's hurt. Bad. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment, but first... Giving medical and welfare assistance to our armed forces and veterans, collecting much-needed blood, training our citizens for service in case of a national emergency, and always on the spot first with disaster relief, these are some of the many services of the American Red Cross. But this all costs money, $85 million this year. So please answer the call. Give generously to the Red Cross. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Somebody sent for Doc. Uh, yeah, when the dealers went after him. Oh. Uh, uh, don't know. Look uh, don't try to move now. Uh, Looks like she was hit twice. Uh, Matt, do you think that she have a chance at all? I don't know, Kitty. Uh, poor kid. Oh, oh, oh. It's all right, honey. Doc will be here soon. What? Why did they shoot me? Well, I, I think they were trying to get me, Nora. Not you. Why did they do it? Why? Oh. Oh, where's Doc? Why doesn't he get here? Do you want me to go after you, Mr. Dillon? Oh, please. I, I feel so... So... I... No, Chester, there's no need for Doc to hurry now. Oh, Matt. She was so... so... Yeah. Well, Doc can take care of her when he gets here. Looks like Billy Mallor really pulled something this time, Mr. Billy. No. How do you know it was Billy, Chester? Well, sir, 
Half a dozen people saw him fire through the window and then ride off down the street. Yeah. I got a feeling those shots weren't wild. They were aimed. Only they were aimed at me. You were just lucky, Mr. Dillon. Where's Billy now, Chester? I don't know, sir. I heard the Maller Bunch is getting ready to pull out. They're milling around the street out in front of their hotel. King Maller and Tom Wayne are there. Yeah. Well, they'll cover Billy, of course. It's going to be a lot tougher this time. Yes, sir. A whole lot tougher, I reckon. Kitty? Yeah. Will you sort of take charge of things here until Doc shows up? Oh, sure, Mac. You go on. Get your posse. Posse? You'll need one, Miss. When you move in with a posse, you ask for a gunfight. Works on a man like an out-and-out challenge. I'm going to handle it alone. But there must be 50 of them, Matt. Only three that count, as long as we can control the Mallers and Tom Wayne. The others don't matter. Marshal! Huh? Oh, Kelvy. You got another suggestion for the best interests of the town? Now, listen here. You can't go up there, Marshal. That'll just lead to more killing. Won't do anybody any good. This wouldn't have happened, you know, if you'd taken my advice and not thrown that boy in jail. And it wouldn't have happened if you'd have stayed out of it and left him in jail, Kelvy. Tomorrow morning, he'd have sobered up and cooled off. Well, what's done's done. But they're getting ready to leave now. You can pass the word for King not to bring the boy along when he comes up next year and let it go at that. Don't make it any worse now, Marshal. Yeah. Let it go at that, huh? Don't antagonize him, huh? Look the other way. It's just Billy Maller kicking up his heels, so let's stay real quiet. And maybe he won't commit another murder. Murder? It wasn't murder. That was an accident. It was murder. He meant to kill somebody, and he did. The only accident about it was the fact that he didn't kill me. Well, it's just a common dance hall girl. Nobody's going to pay any mind. I mind, Kelby. And the law minds. And you stay out of this from now on. You understand me. Now, Dylan, you're not talking to some saddle bum. Yeah. Chester. Yes, sir. Matt. Yeah, Kitty. I'm not going to help to go get yourself killed. It seems to me I'm being sold awful short around here. They outnumber you 20 to 1. Kitty, if I let Mallard get away with this, I'd be through in Dodge City, and so would the law. It was hard work bringing the law in here. And it's been hard work keeping it here. And it'd be ten times harder trying to bring it back if it ever got shoved out. Yeah. All right, Matt. But do one thing, will you? What? Wait here. I'll be right back. Right. Here, take this shotgun with you. Red keeps it back of the bar, but you take it, Matt. It'll help the odds a little, at least. It, it's a good idea, Mr. Dillon. I'd sure feel a lot easier in my mind if you took it. Well, all right. Thanks, Kitty. I'll see you. She was a pretty little thing. Yeah. Seems a shame. There they are, Mr. Dillon. Out there in the street in front of the hotel. Yeah, I see him. Looks like the whole Maller mob. This ain't going to be very easy. Uh, King and Wayne are there, but I don't see Billy. No, sir, I don't either. Those two are the ones to watch, Chester. Don't let them start a play. Yes, Mr. Dillon, I understand. Here comes Marshal, Mr. Mallard. King, I want that boy of yours. What's the charge this time, Dylan? Murder. That girl died. She died. Now, where's Billy? 
Where'd you get the idea he had anything to do with it? Half a dozen people saw him fire the shots from the street. Well, I say he wasn't near that street. Well, don't say it to me. Say it in court. Now, where is he, King? Marshal, there's 40 of my riders standing here in the street. Every one of them packing a gun. I suppose you just turn around and start walking. I said, where's Billy? All I got to do is give the word, Dylan. These boys will drop you right in your track. You're not giving anybody the word, mm. King. Huh? Buckshot's got a pretty fair spread. Now, at the first sign of any move by this bunch, and I'll get you and Wayne with one blast. Now, you better warn him, King. <coughs> Dylan, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Billy rode out of town, headed south. That's his horse tied there at the rail, isn't it? All right, where is he, King? Inside the hotel? Now, look, Marshal, there's no call for all this. Maybe Billy did get a little bit out of line. He's always been a high-spirited young'un, but there's no reason for us to lose our heads. You know you got no case against him. Every one of my men here will swear he wasn't anywhere near that shoot. They'll get their chance at the trial. Well, now, that's just the trouble. We can't hang around here waiting for a trial. It's cost me money, but I'm willing to spend quite a bit, Marshal, to avoid the inconvenience. Never mind, King. Don't be a fool, Marshal. Shut up. Wayne, move over a little closer to him, Him. All right, that's it right there. All right. The rest of you men fish your guns out and drop them on the ground. Now, slow and easy. No sudden moves. Watch him, Chester. Yes, sir, I am. All right. Back up now, out into the street, away from those guns. A whole bunch of you. Move! Here, Chester, take the shotgun. Keep him covered. Yes, sir. Hold it now. Just like you are. Nobody will get hurt. Dylan, what you gonna do? I'm going in the hotel and bring out that kid. Watch him, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Well, now's your time. Go ahead if you want. The Mallers won't bother you. Thank you, Marshal. And the best of luck to you, sir. Billy, you better give up. Billy, you haven't got a chance. If you know what's going on. Now hold it, Billy. Throw your gun out into the hall. 
I'm going to kill you, Dylan. It's your last chance, Billy. Now come out under the hall and give yourself up. I'll kill you, so help me. Dylan. Dylan, was that... Is he dead? Yeah. I gave him two chances. He wouldn't take them. Yeah. Headstrong. Or was worse. Guess maybe... Maybe I didn't bring him up right. It's too late to worry about that now. But uh, I'm sorry, King, for Billy and for the girl both. He had it coming. I know that, Marshal. I tried to stop it. Too late. The only way I knew. But you wouldn't bluff. Tom, go get him. We'll have to bury him in Kansas. All right, King. We'll be leaving Dodge right after. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Charlotte Lawrence, and Barney Phillips. Polly Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Every Sunday evening, CBS Radio presents My Little Margie, a hilarious comedy show starring Charles Farrell and Gail Storm. It's a worthy addition to the Sunday Funday lineup, a program that's packed with laughs from start to finish. Listen for My Little Margie on most of these same stations, tomorrow night presented by CBS Radio. This is the CBS Radio Network. one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William 
Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I'm ready for spring, Chester. The tail end of winter always gets on my nerves. Well, it shouldn't be long now. The worst of it's bound to be over. Well, I hope so. Here, let's try Delmonico's here. Huh? I'm always ready to eat, Mr. Dillon. Morning, Matt. Chester. Oh, Morning. hi, Kitty. How about joining me, huh? Well, thank you. you pull up a chair, Chester. Yes, sir. Sure. You're up early this morning, Matt. Usually you don't even start breathing till noon. It's too cold to sleep, Kitty. A jail stove always burns itself out about 5 o'clock in the morning. From then on, you just have to... Well, what is it, Matt? Chester, that second table from the window over there. Hmm? Those three men there, you know them? No, sir, I don't think you do. Well, I do. Ran into them about four years ago out in Arizona Territory. That's the Pueblo gang. Never heard of them coming this far east before. Well. You want some help, Mr. No, just sit tight, Chester. Ma'am? Uh, order me some sausage and buckwheat cakes, Kitty, will you? I'll be right back. I don't want to stay in this town. I don't like it enough, but go ahead. Morning, boys. It's the Parks Brothers, isn't it? Ed and Rio and Chuck Evans. Well, what about it? Easy, Rio. It's Dillon, the U.S. Marshal, the one I told you about. Yeah, I bet you did. What'd you tell him, Chuck? Look, Dillon, our food's getting cold. You got something on your mind or not? Nothing important, Rio. I figure it's quite an honor to have the Pueblo gang in town. I just thought I'd drop over and tell you how I felt about it. And uh, how do you feel? Well, that depends, Ed. Are you boys here on business or pleasure? Does it uh, make a difference? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes a difference. I know your reputation west of here. Half the stage holdups in the last five years from Colorado to the California border can be laid right at your door. But as far as I know, you're clean in Dodge City so far. Now, All right, Dillon, you just we... keep it that way. You make one move here and your time's up. Right then you're short and I'll take you, all three of you. You understand? Sure, we understand. We'll think it over, Dylan. Let you know what we decided to do. Rio, you I'll... talk too much. Now, see you around, boys. You can put the gun away now, Chester. All right. I was just going to be ready in case. Uh, Matt, I thought I'd tell you. Those boys are mean. They're on the Texas Trail last night. They're just downright mean. Yeah, I know. What do we do, Mr. Dillon? Run them out of town? Not unless they give us some reason to, Chester. Yes, sir. Do. The law doesn't say you can hang a man because he might steal a horse. Yeah, forget it. Let's eat, huh? Our old train's just about ready to pull out, looks like. Yeah, it's on time. It's three o'clock. Be in St. Louis tomorrow night, Chicago the next day. If the engine holds up. <laughs> oh, they don't break down so much anymore. They're getting them worked out so they're pretty dependable. Yeah, I guess so. You ever get a hankering to take a trip back east, Mr. Dillon, just to see how things have changed? Uh, not me, Chester. I've been on the frontier too long. I'd be lost back there. I wouldn't know how to act. I, I guess man could get his rope kinked over which fork to use or what to hey, do Matt. with that. What? Oh, hi, Will. <laughs> you down watching your competition pull out? There'll be a stagecoach running for a long time to come yet. Railroad's not bothering me any. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Something else is, though. No? Matt, the stage from Buckeye is more than two hours overdue. I'm getting a little worried. Well, why? It's usually late, isn't it? Not on this particular day of the month. Well, what's the day particular? Gold dust. Uh, this is the day those placer mines out there always ship their cleanup. Charlie's never missed getting it here at 3 o'clock on time for the eastbound Santa Fe. Not once. 
Who's riding the shotgun, Will? Houston Jack. Well, he's a good man. I doubt if there's any cause to worry. That shipment runs eighty or hundred thousand dollars sometimes, man. Never been laid before. Oh, Charlie will probably roll in any minute now. Uh, we'll see you later, Will. So long. What do you think, Mr. Dillon? Same as you do, Chester. Let's ride up and meet that stage. I still think I heard a horse went in, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I thought I heard it, too. We must be an hour and a half from town the way the stage runs. He sure is late, all right. I hope late is all it is, Chester. I hope it's not... There. There, there it is again, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it came from that draw over there, somewhere around that sumac thicket. Come on. Come on. Look, Mr. Dillon. Wheel tracks leading off the trail. Yeah. Run into the dead gallop and out of control. Well, Chester, there's the stage. I don't see any sign of life, Mr. Dillon. Well, let's take a look. There's tracks all around. Must have been three or four horses here. Yeah, three the way I'm figuring it. I'll lay any odds you want. It's just some of the... That's Houston Jack, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Shot in the back of the head. And he didn't take any chances. He must have ridden up behind the stage and fired without any warning. That's probably what spooked the horses and started the runaway. Yeah, they shot the lead horse. It's an old trick. Charlie's still up here on the box. They got him, too. Uh, that strong box has been forced open. It's empty. All right, Chester, let's cut these horses loose and get them out of the traces. Huh? All right, sir. Oh. Come on, now, boy. Get it. It's the same way they used to work it out west. Shoot the guard in the back and let the team run until they're far enough off the trail and then kill the lead horse to stop them. You mean that Pueblo gang? Yeah, who else? Oh, oh. That's a good thing there weren't any passengers. They'd have got the same treatment. All right, there you go, boy. I think there were some passengers, Mr. Dillon. One, at least. What? There's a couple of trunks tied on top and a carpet bag of some kind inside the stage. Here, let's have a look. Well, the only bodies are the guards and the drivers. Say, maybe one of the gang was riding as a passenger. They wouldn't leave trunks behind it. What is it? There's stuff in the carpet bag. Belongs to a woman. There's no woman here? Yeah, I know. Well, then they must have taken her. Yeah. It's almost dark. Come on, Chester, let's try to pick up their trail. And it's just no use going any farther, Mr. Dillon. It's too dark to tell what we're doing. Well, they were heading towards the river here. Let's take a look through these willows, and if we don't find anything, then we'll ride on back to town. All right, sir. I still keep getting a faint whiff of wood smoke from somewhere. I sure wish we would find the fire. It's getting colder than the hit. Wait a minute. Uh, look over there. Well, I'll swear. It's fire, all right. Or what's left of one, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you suppose you're still I don't there? know. Let's leave the horses here and go up on foot, huh? All right, sir. Couldn't have left too long ago. That fire would have burned itself out. Well. Huh. 
I'd say we're too late, Mr. Dillon. I think they've gone. Yeah, it looks that way, all right. Yeah, a half hour or an hour ago. Made a fast camp, stayed long enough to warm up, and then they went... What was that? I don't know. They're over here, Chester. There's somebody lying on the ground. Help me. Help me, please. Yeah. Throw some brush on the fire, Chester. Yes, sir. No, it's all right, miss. It, it's all right now. Three of them robbed the stage, killed the driver and the guard, brought me with them. Anything I can do, Mr. Dillon? No, Chester, I'm afraid not. For the love of it. Chester, get some light over here. Grab one of those branches that's caught fire. Now, Mr. Dillon, just a second. Easy now, ma'am. Just easy now. It's going to be all right. I pleaded with them. Begged them to, to let me go. Here. This help in? Yeah, I'll hold it over here. Mm. Helen. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't let me go. Helen Ford. And when they left, they drew their guns and shot me. Easy now. They shot me. You know who they were? Helen? Helen, can you hear me? One. One named Rio. One called Chuck. They sat on their horses. Shot me. Then they laughed. She's in awful bad shape, Mr. Dillon. We ought to get her to dog. Shot me. And laughed. But it didn't matter. Not that. Not. Well, I guess it's too late now. Yeah, it's too late. I'll carry her back to Dodge. Get me your saddle blanket, will you, Chester? You knew her, Mr. Dillon? A long time ago. Then things happen the way they do. Later she married Bill Ford and went out to Colorado. It's a long time ago. I didn't expect I'd ever see her again. It's a bad thing, Mr. Nellon. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to see him hang for it. Turn for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, everybody's got a heart. That's a plenty solid reason for everybody to support with generous contributions the annual fund drive of the heart campaign. Don't forget, what your money pays for is aimed at making the sick well and keeping the well from getting sick. Support the heart campaign again this year. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. Chester, we'll check the livery stable first. Yes, they could have pulled out, of course, but I'll lay odds they came straight back into town. You won't take long to find out. Now, let's go in. Who's there? Who is it? Matt Dillon, is that you, Mr. Kelvin? Oh, yeah, sure is, Marshal. Hey, let me get a lantern lit. I'm just fixing to lock up the stable and go over and grab myself a bite to eat. Running things alone again tonight. The confounded boy didn't show up. Like he's not drunk and... There. 
Well, come on, Marshal. We've got a fire going back in the office. Come on back. Set us. Uh, I'd like to, Calvin, but we don't have time. I'm looking for some horses. Well, I got them, Marshal. You want to buy, trade, or hire? Now, just look. Yeah. There are three fellows staying over at the Dodge House. They've been there about a week. Ed and Rio, Parks, and Chuck Evans. They're keeping their horses here. Here they are, right back here. And if I ever saw a ruination of good horse flesh, this is it. There. Take a look there. That one belongs to the oldest Parks boy, Ed, and the one next to it's Rio's. They've been rode, Mr. Dillon. Mm. They've been rode plenty. Yeah. What time did they come in, Kelvin? Well, about an hour ago, more or less. They're gone since forenoon, just come back a little while ago. Look at that horse. Been rubbed down twice. He's still wet. They didn't say where they'd been, did they? No, not them. They ain't the talking kind. Just left their horses and went on over to the hotel. Well, wherever they was, though, they must have been riding like the devil himself was chasing them. Well, maybe he was. Uh, thanks, Mr. Keller. Yeah. Yo. Sure. I guess there's not much doubt of it, Chester. No, sir. It was them, all right. And I could have stopped it before it happened. A man shouldn't be jailed on suspicion, I figured. Just because he might do something wrong. Well, my. Everybody has to play it the way he sees it. And only sometimes you can see it a lot plainer afterward. What are we going to do? Go get him, that's all. Well, where do we start looking? The Texas Trail. Oh, I one thing, Chester, before we go in. Now, you leave the play on this to me, huh? Just keep me covered, that's all. Mr. Dillon, what was her name before she was married? Marlowe. Helen Marlowe. All right, come on, let's go. <laughs> A real dull evening up until now. How are you, Mac? Chester? Hi, Miss Kitty. Kitty. Uh, I'm looking for the Pueblo gang. Have any of them been in here? Why, yeah. One of them's here now. Leo Parks. He's over there at the faro table. Huh? Well, what's wrong, Mac? What happened? Well, they held up the Buckeye stage. Killed Charlie and Houston Jack. And a passenger. A woman. Helen Ford. Ah. No. All right, Chester. Oh, be careful, Matt. Yeah, sure, Kitty. Just cover me, Chester. That's all. Yes, sir. Five hundred says I've got the car. That's too much of me. Are you going to cover me or not? What's the matter? You all a bunch of bikers? <laughs> Maybe they haven't been out robbing stagecoaches, Rio. What do you mean by that? Maybe they don't make that living by killing women. Dylan, a man could get in trouble shooting off his mouth that way. You're already in trouble. All right, boys, Rio's checking in his hand. The game's over. You can slide out at the end of the table over there. You're under arrest for murder, Rio. I don't know what you're talking about, Dylan. Murder. The murder that you're going to hang for. Now, where are the other two? Go find him if you want him. I'm going to as soon as I finish with you. I said you're under arrest, Rio, and I get your hands up. Oh, and I don't. Do you're not going to make any play. You don't have the guts. Shooting a man in the back is more your line, Rio. You're killing a woman. Now get your hands up. That's better. All right, Chester, get his gun. Seems like it's getting colder, Mr. Dillon. Clear as a bell, though. Look at that moon. Where do you suppose they are? You've been in nearly every saloon on Front Street. I don't know, Chester, but wherever they are, we're going to find them. And you know something, Mr. Dillon? When we do arrest the other two, they're as good as hung with the evidence we got on them. I haven't arrested them yet. 
Maybe them other two won't be taken as easy as Rio. That's up to them. If they want to surrender, they can. I've never shot a man with his hands up. Chester. Huh? Ben's barber shop over there. The man that he's shaving. It's kind of hard to tell with all that lather no, on. No, I it said, says. Parks, come on. And there's just him and Ben in the shop. I wonder where Chuck Evans is. We'll worry about him later. Uh, just help yourself to a seat, gentlemen. Be ready for you just as soon as... Uh, oh, evening, Marshal. How you been? I didn't know you were in the habit of shaving outlaws. Uh, well, may- maybe you're mistaken, Marshal. Uh, you just have a seat there and No, I... I recognize him, all right. It's Ed Parks. Uh, well, uh... looks like you got the advantage of me, Dylan. Well, we can't have that, Ed. Wipe the leather off his face, Ben. Yes, sir. Sure thing, Marshal. Uh, just a second now, Mr. Parks. There. There you are. It's too bad you have to leave that shave half finished, Ed. But they'll give you a free one just before they hang you. What are you talking about, Dylan? Uh, now, now, gentlemen... Ed, you're under arrest for murder. Get your hands up. Your brother's waiting for you at the jail. You arrested real? What about the hands, Ed? Are you going to put them up? No, dirty kid. Huh? That was a fast move for a barber, Ben. I, I knew he had a gun under the towel, Marshal, but of course I couldn't say anything about it. Well, thank you, Ben. And if you'll send the bill for your shaving mug to the stage company, they'll probably take care of it for you. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Chester, spill some water on him. I want him to walk to jail. <laughs> I bet Chuck Evans got clean away, Mr. Dillon. The word must have got to him. Well, he had to do it awful fast. The clerk said he checked out of the hotel less than ten minutes ago. Kelvin? The light must hurt his eyes. He never keeps a lantern burning. Afraid of fire, maybe. Kelvin? Are you there, Kelvin? Yes. Hey, what's wrong? Who is it? Matt Dillon. Oh, Strike a light, a man could fall over something in this stable and break his neck. All right, all right. I just don't get excited. I'm used to it myself. I know just where everything is and don't see any point in wasting oil. When I... Now, what's on your mind, Marshal? Chuck Evans. Is his horse still here? Yes, indeed. It most certainly is. As a matter of fact, he's back there saddling up right now. Good. I told him it seemed like a fool time of night to start out on a trip. Hey, you can't reason with anybody that treats horses the way that bunch does. Uh, I guess not. Calvin! Wait. Well, go on, answer it. Uh, yeah. uh, yes? What is it? Give me a hand back here, will you? Tell him yes. All right. I'm coming. What's this all about, Marshal? Nothing to get yourself worked up about. Just stay right here and stay out of the way. Uh-huh. All right, Chester. Yes, sir. He's got a lantern back there at the stall. Yeah. Now, you were right about one thing, Chester. He's trying to leave town. Give me a hand with this, Kelvin. I can't seem to get the... You going somewhere, Chuck? Now, look, look, Dylan. You got nothing on me. Lay off. The Parks boys are in jail. Uh, I don't know anything about it, Dylan. You can't prove a thing, and you can't shoot me. I'm not even wearing a gun. It, it, it's hanging there on the saddle horn. Yeah. So I see. If the other boys did something, I I, I don't know anything about you're it. You're a liar, Chuck. And you're a coward. You've got no call to talk like Shut that. Up. Now, you're under arrest. Chester get his gun off his saddle. Look out, Mr. Dillon. He's got another gun. I'll kill you, Dillon. Say, help me. You're scared, Chuck. You're too scared to shoot straight. Oh, help me. <laughs> well, I guess that does it, Chester. Come on. What, what, what is it, Marshal? What, what happened? Evans is dead. The Parks boys are going to hang your short three customers, Kelvin. Well, who's going to pay the stable bill? The stable bill? 
Mm. Well, you got their horses. Sell them. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Well, it serves them right. Anybody that would treat a horse the way that bunch did, David. Uh, I guess it's over, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's over, Chester. And it's just as well. This country would be a lot better off with them fellas dead than alive. I guess so. Huh. Even the moon looks brighter. Yeah. Mr. Dillon, you're still thinking you should have jailed him on suspicion, aren't you? Oh, I'd have half a dodge in jail if I started that. No, Chester, it's the kind of a chance a lawman has to take. Yes, sir. Whether he likes it or not. Yes, sir. But I'm not liking it much right now. In the morning, I'm going to have a talk with the preacher about holding the service for Helen. That's about all I can do for her now. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was especially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Tom Tully, Paul Dubov, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Louise Lewis. Parley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Starting tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations, there will be more Arthur Godfrey and his gang, presented by CBS Radio for our Sunday listeners. Folks who are regular Arthur Godfrey fans know there's been a 30-minute roundup of Arthur Godfrey time Sundays at the Star's Address. But starting tomorrow, there'll be 30 minutes more with Arthur Godfrey and all the wonderful Arthur Godfrey gang. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Lionel Barrymore is your host, on the Sunday Night Playhouse, on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. This morning, Mr. Bumby. Huh? Oh, hello, Marshal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Morning, Sam. Is uh, Kitty around? Oh, don't know she's up yet, but if she is, she ought to be down soon. <laughs> oh, I'll wait. Nippy this morning. Oh, feels good. It's a nice time of year. Huh? Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like spring. So. Uh, Sam. You better wash that glass over. Huh? Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, can I get you something? Beer, maybe? Uh, got any coffee? Sure. Just made a pot. Oh, I'll be fine. Her face is something wondrous. That's pretty, man. <laughs> you got a pretty boy. Oh, it is. Good enough for calling hogs, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you, you just got up? Uh, a while ago. Why? Oh, it just strikes me I haven't seen you close to early like this. Uh huh. No, no, I, I, you look fine. I, 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 mean, I mean that you. You better quit by your head. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It's... Where's Sam? Oh, he's bringing in coffee. Oh, Sam, cup for me, please. Sure, Miss Kitty. What's your occasion, Matt? Uh. Kitty, uh, there's a party tomorrow night, a dance. It's a benefit for the new school down at the hall, you know. <laughs> and uh, ever fellows to bring a girl, you, you know. <laughs> it happens at dances. Go on. Well, uh, what I'm trying to... Will you go uh, with me? I'd kind of like to, Matt, but no thanks. Oh. Well, I got to work here. You know that. Besides... Well, you I... ought to be able to get off. Well, even if I could, ladies might not take kindly to it, Matt. I'm not rightly polite society. Ah, oh, what do you care about? What? The... Well, thanks anyway, Matt. Ah, that smells wonderful. Sammy, I think I'll marry you. <laughs> Me? <laughs> shucks. <laughs> Me? Oh, shucks. <laughs> But, uh, listen, Kitty, about the dance, I, I've already bought the you're, tickets. You're sweet, Matt, and uh, I thank you kindly for thinking of me, but uh, you better ask someone else. Well, it, it isn't, Ki- Sam, will, will you go and polish up your glasses, please? Hmm? Oh, sure, Mr. Dillon, sure. Mm-hmm. N- now, look, Kitty, I'm asking you to go with me. It, well, it's important to me that you go. Are you making love to me, Matt? At this hour in the morning? No, no, I, I mean it. I I want you to go to the dance. You want to be embarrassed. You want everyone to stare at us. You know what they'll say? My, my, the marshal really should have better sense than to bring that woman here. It ain't decent. It ain't proper. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's true. <laughs> I'm a hostess at the Texas Trail, a, a saloon. You know what they think about me. Well, I... Will you go, Kitty? No. I'll call by for you at seven, huh? I'll drink a bottle of whiskey and clout some old biddy on the head. Then you'll be sorry. Oh, Kitty. I haven't got anything to wear, Matt. I can't wear my working clothes. You look just fine, like you are, Kitty. Just fine, just like you are. Marshal. Yeah. I shouldn't, but I guess I'll go to the dance with you. (laughs) I'll be ready at seven. How do you talk about a woman like Kitty? The color of her hair, eyes, the shape of her legs, the way she spoke, thought. 
Well, that's the picture you had to get by looking and hearing. Otherwise, you, you'd never know it. And I felt real good about taking Kitty to the party. It's the first time we'd really be out in company. And I liked the idea. Morning, Mr. Dillon. Good morning, Chester. Nice day. What is that? That, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, all over my desk, that. Ink. Yes, sir, I know. I was just cleaning it up, Mr. Dillon. Seems like a big blue bottle fly, last of his kind this fall, I guess. Big fool blue bottle fly was a setting on your desk, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you're slopping it all over the floor, Chester. Yes, sir, I see it. That lazy fool blue bottle fly was a stomping all over your desk, Mr. Dillon, and I took a whack at him with a paper I happened to have in my hand, and I got him. Well, thanks a lot. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. If there's anything in this world I hate, it's a big maggoty blue bottle yeah, fly. Yeah, 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 I know, Chester. Uh, the, the mail come in yet? Yes, sir. A couple of minutes ago. It's right over there. Oh, okay. I think that should do it, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Anything likely in the mail, Mr. Dillon? No, no. Uh, look, Chester, uh, we better get these government circulars posted. To... Would you do that for me? Yes, sir, I'll do that. Uh, say, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? About the dance tomorrow. Now, what about it? Well, you're going, aren't you, sir? Doc's going. He's taking Ms. McNish. I I'm going. Everybody's going. You are going, aren't you, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I'm going. Don't seem right, a man. You're standing not to go to a big social like we're... You are? Yes. Well, that's fine. Just fine. Uh, Doc and, and me, we were talking, and it just didn't seem right to us that a man like you didn't have no real nice sweet girl to escort to a big social. I got one, Chester. A real nice sweet girl. I'm taking Kitty. Miss Kitty? I asked her before I came down if she accepted. Well, that's good. Miss Kitty. Uh, that's right, Chester. Uh, I uh, got to get a couple of letters off to Washington, Chester. You, you want to go and see about posting those circulars, huh? Yes, Mr. Dillon. Ah, fine. Uh, uh... Dillon? Oh, what is it, Chester? Well, Mr. Dillon, it it ain't none of my business, and I, I did not have no right to say it. Say what? Well, sir, I... I... Yeah? I was wondering if I might borrow one of them fancy ties off you for the party. That's not your business? That's what you haven't got any right to say. Yes, sir. No, that's right. You're a liar, Chester. But you can borrow a tie. I thank you kindly, Mr. Dillon. You work for a long time with a man, and you share a lot of life and a lot of death. And after a while, you... You know him even better than yourself. Well, that's the way it is with Chester and with me. Now, he had something on his mind, and I figured after a while he'd get it off. Well, the morning went, and it was almost noon when Chester came back. Gonna go have some dinner, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I think I will. How about you? Hungry as a raggle-bone possum. <laughs> Did you get the posters up? Yes, sir. Well, okay, let's go. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I guess there's something you ought to know, sir. There's talk. Yeah. All right, Chester, come on, get it out. It's all over town. About you taking Miss Kitty to the dance tomorrow night. What do you mean, all over town? I only asked her this morning. Yes, sir, I know. Best I can figure, Sam over at the Texas Trail must heard you and let it slip. There's been a mighty fierce mess of gum clobbering up and down all over. All right. Uh, thanks for telling me, Chester. 
It ain't none of my business. Yeah, I know. You said that before. Yes, sir. I surely did. Well, let's go get something to eat. It's hard to tell about people. Maybe it's hard to tell about yourself because you come under that same heading, people. And when they're mean and small, there's not an animal to touch them. Chester and I walked down the street, and it didn't take long to hear and see what was going on. Some of the drifters leaning against the wall on the corner came right out with it. Morning, Marshal. I understand there's a gal in town has got herself a new boat. What did you say? <laughs> Maybe you ought to look into it, Marshal. Folks are being downright rude. Mister, you're gonna... Come on, Chester. <laughs> Ought to haul him in. Every one. Yeah. What are you going to charge him with? Pestilence, Mr. Dillon. Just plain pestilence. I knew better what Kitty had meant about the ladies of the town when a couple came out of Olivet's dry goods store. He didn't see me until it was I'm too late. I'm to the dance committee. It's indecent, that's what it is, why she's common. Nothing but a common saloon woman. What's this city coming to when a United States marshal... Ooh. Morning, Miss Sprinkle. Uh. <laughs> when a man's born, they, they say he's blessed or cursed with a lot of things already in him. Take pride, for instance. Sometimes pride can be a curse. Well, maybe I had more in my share. Maybe it would have been a sight kinder if I'd not taken Kitty the dance. But I did. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this hint for weekend driving. Whatever you do, be moderate. Be obedient to all traffic laws. Be careful. Use your head and don't take chances. Now for the second act of Gunsmoke. I picked up Kitty at the Texas Trail at 7 the next evening. She was waiting by the side door, and when I saw her, she kind of moved back in the shadows, almost as though she was ashamed for me to see her. Hi. Hello, Matt. Are you all set? Well, I guess so. Uh, Matt, are you sure? Hey, you... Kitty, you look fine. Yeah, you look just fine. <laughs> Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> We walked along the street down to the hall, and I, I kept looking at her like, like I say, you know, you, you, you had to know this, Kitty, to understand what I mean, and <laughs> even then you get a surprise. She was like a 17-year-old on her first date, and she was like all the women you'd ever known and loved, soft and innocent. And something else, something that's female, and you can't figure out what. Something that makes you drunk without a drink inside you. It was snowing a little, and the flakes caught in her hair and melted into the black of her velvet cloak. And just before we went in, I looked at her again. And I didn't care. I, I was proud she was with me. Oh, evening, Marshal Dillon. Evening, Miss Murphy. Uh, you know Miss Russell? I do. You have your tickets, Marshal Dillon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Ah, here we are. Fine. Uh, go right in, won't you? Oh, sure. Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Murphy. Is there somewhere I can put my cloak? Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, the ladies' reception room is right through there. I, I didn't catch the name. Catherine Russell, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll wait for you. Thanks. You better. I could see them through the big open doors in the hall. They were all there. Faces flushed, smiling, happy, dancing. And all the women seemed pretty and the men handsome. And Chester was up on the platform calling the dance and Doc was fiddling. And I was waiting for my dancing partner, Miss Kitty Russell. What took you so long? I'm sorry, Matt. I had a skirmish with one of the genteel females in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Why, so she. <laughs> you know, I get the idea I'm not welcome around here. Uh, uh, let's go in and get some punch, huh? Sure. <laughs> How are you, John? <laughs> oh, that's a nice dress, Kitty. Well, I haven't worn it since a few years back in New Orleans. Hey, Marshall. Oh, Miss Kitty. Let's talk. Well, hiya. Oh, fine, Doc. Hello, Doc. <laughs> I say, <clears throat> say, we got a bottle of whiskey outside. You care to join it? <laughs> oh, this punch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not right now. Thank you, Doc. Oh, well, sure. Hey, Miss Kitty, I saw you come in. Best looking woman in here. <laughs> oh, there's lots of scratching going on. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. <laughs> if you see Mrs. Magnish, don't tell her where I am, will you? Man gets kind of dry, fiddling. Oh, I've been so long. So long, Doc. Uh, Kitty? I guess so. Uh, Mr. Sprinkle, have you met Miss Catherine Russell? Uh, no, no, I'm afraid I haven't. You got a short memory, Mr. Sprinkle. Huh? I could have swore it was you in the Texas Trail a couple of weeks back. Drunk or no hoot owl. Don't you remember I had to slap your face? I, I think... Edward? Well, I, it, Edward? Yes, dear. You let somebody else take care of the punch. I want you to come with oh, me. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I promised. I, I'm, I'm on the committee. Even, Miss Sprinkle. I have no wish to speak to you, Marshal Dillon, or this woman you brought with you. I will not have my husband serving such people. Aren't you being a trifle bad-mannered, Miss Sprinkle? How dare you say that? Well, aren't you? I suggest that you leave, Marshal. Emmy. You're not wanted here. Not with that woman you've seen fit to bring. Come on, Matt. I want to go. No. This is a public dance, Miss Frinkle. Right now, you're trying to make it private. If you can't behave like a lady, I'll thank you to leave this lady's presence. Well, now, see here, Marshal. You can't talk like that to my wife. Hey, Kitty! What do you say, Kitty? Hmm. Matt, please. I want to go. We're not going anywhere. We're staying. Uh, uh, how about some music? All, all right now, folks. It'll be a walk this time. Thanks for the punch, Mr. Sprinkle. Come on, Kitty. I warned you, Matt. Now... Please, will you take me out of here before something happens? Nothing's going to happen, Kitty. You and me are going to dance. Have a good time. That's all. You're acting like a kid. Matt, it won't work. I've seen this kind of thing before. May I have this dance, Miss Kitty? Please, Matt. You're being pig-headed and you know it. Let's get out. You're refusing me, Miss Kitty? Oh, Matt. We danced, but it wasn't what I hoped it would be. 
Kitty closed her eyes. I guess she was trying to blot it out, but I could see the other couples looking, whispering, and one by one dropping away over into a small group that got larger. And there were only about six of us left when the wall sent it. And that's when the stranger and a couple of his pals walked out onto the floor. They were drifters, probably been in town for a week. And they were having their fun before they moved on. Marshal, I got a painful duty. Yeah? Uh, folks in this town seem real upset about you bringing that mm, woman in here. What's your name? Oh, I'm just a fella. I kind of made myself and my friends here a committee of three, seeing as how everything's done by committees here. And we, <laughs> yeah, we figured it would be best if you take your um, friend home. Mister, I'm the marshal in Dodge City, and I'm... I'm leaving. You're staying here, Kitty. She's smarter than you, Marshal. Everything all right? Everything's Mr. fine, Chester. Now, this ain't a matter of law, you know, Marshal. It's decency and, and, and what's right. Yeah, so. and Marshal, this ain't right. Mister? I'm taking this badge off. Chester, you stay here with Kitty. Matt, don't you do it. Now, come Matt. on outside. You! We're going to talk some more about this out there. Ah, oh, it's cold outside. Now, you be a good fella and get out of where you ain't wanted. You know I won't hit you in here, don't you? Were you thinking of doing that, Marshal? Now, that ain't lawful. I ain't done nothing. Kitty. Kitty, wait. Now, now there's a gal with sense. All right, yeah. mister. Now, I'm telling you. You and your pals are going to have to come out sooner or later, and when you do, you better start hightailing it out of Dodge before I catch up with you. We'll think of that. Oh, sure. We sure will, <laughs> Marshal. Just three no-good drifters, hating the law, finding pleasure in trouble. Kitty had gone, and I went out into the street. It had stopped snowing. Just cold. Much colder. I went up to the Texas Trail. There was only two people in there. Some guy, dead drunk on a table, and someone else standing at the bar, looking into the mirror at me. Uh, well, you haven't, Mr. Dillon. Nothing, sir. Yeah. Well, uh, I got some things to do in the back. You give me a call if anyone comes in, will you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm... I'm so I'm sorry, kid. Shut up. I, I'm sorry. I'm bad. Bad. Oh, kitty. Oh, it's all right. Sure, it's all right. I'm so mad. I, I could... Yeah, I know. I, I should have known better. No, it, it was me, not you. No, I wasn't that either. It was all those polite ladies and gentlemen. Give me a kerchief, will you? Yeah. Here. It's been a long time since I cried. Yeah, sure. It wasn't so much for me. For you. I, want, I wanted to cry right there in the hall. Watching you and knowing there was nothing you could do. Nice mess of people we got in Dodge. No, it's not them, Matt. It's me. I've run into this before. The only difference was I didn't have you around. I wanted it to be right tonight because of you. A lot of narrow-minded prayer spouting. Yeah. They hurt your pride, didn't they? No. No, it, it wasn't that. No. No, I... 
I wanted you to go with me. That made me real happy. But maybe we're different, Matt. You and me figure life different to them. That's not their fault. There's a lot of folks there I know. I, I smile at them on the street. They talk to me. But tonight, well, that was different. I made them uncomfortable. Yeah? Well, they didn't do a bad job with you. Oh, you can't look at it that way. And you can't go fighting the whole town, either. There's three fellas going to get hurt. No, I don't want you to do, the, do that, Matt. You just let it go. Let it go, Matt. They don't mean nothing. You know what means something to me? What? That you asked me to go to the dance with you. I knew what was going to happen, but it was worth the chance. I thank you for it, Matt. You're a funny one. Am I? <laughs> but you sure showed them up, those women. <laughs> the way you look. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> you know, you look pretty fine yourself. Sam? Yeah? Uh, you got any champagne, Sam? What? Have I got any what? Champagne. Well, yeah. I guess maybe. A bottle or two? Yeah, maybe. Sure. Well, break it out. All right. Miss Kitty, I think the next dance is mine. Oh, man. I'd be real pleased, Mr. Dillon. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vivi Janis, Bob Sweeney, Lawrence Dobkin, and Mary Lansing. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Don't miss Robert Trout and his timely roundup of world news tomorrow on most of these same CBS radio stations. Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, Amos and Andy are here every Sunday on the CBS radio network. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.